Hello everyone, welcome to Weekly Manga Recap here on the 8th of June, 2016. I'm Yrod, here with Rolo T. We're going to be talking about some manga. And uh, I believe so. Yeah. I think we're going to try to talk about some manga. Uh, we're going to try. We have something a little bit more important, Nick, to talk about first. I've got a pretty uh, startling announcement I need to make. So, it's good to already sit in. I uh, hope all of our audiences, too, if you're listening to this while you're driving, uh, make sure you pull over your vehicle to the shoulder of the yeah, road first. Emergency lights. Uh, and, uh... Yeah, put on your emergency lights. Turn off the ignition, because you might even, in your stunned astonishment, you might accidentally slam on the on, on the ignition, and uh, you just destroy your car. So uh, make sure you just have all that off. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm watching anime again, Nick. Okay. Shit, I thought that would parlay into an hour and a half. Fuck, no, I didn't read any manga this week, Nick. <laughs> you didn't read anything. I didn't read anything. Uh, if it's not voiced and animated, then it's not good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, I, Nick, I always thought it that it was... Go here. <laughs> I always thought that manga was the only way to go. Then I realized they animated and had music and voices, and it's so much better. Why aren't we doing anime? <laughs> no, I, uh, I've been uh, watching some anime, because I've... I've you know, I've been watching the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure now on, on Funimation, and I didn't realize, or not Funimation, uh, Crunchyroll. I didn't realize at the time that uh, Crunchyroll, I guess if you just wait a week, you can get it for free. I was like, I just had to pay for a subscription, so I have one, and I've just been too lazy to cancel it. So I was like, yeah, fuck it, why don't I check out this Phoenix Wright anime? I like Phoenix Wright, I haven't played the first game in a while, so I've been checking out some of that. And then just on an off chance, I saw um, like a Crunchyroll ad on Facebook for a clip from uh, the show Kiz Neighbor, I think it's called. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's only, you know, they only say the word in Japanese a couple times. But uh, I decided to just give that a shot. I mean, I've, like, I'm like five or six episodes into it and I'm having a lot of fun. Nick, I, I feel like I've, uh, I, I, you know, now I'm excited because now whenever someone asks us an anime related question on our Q and A's, I don't have to immediately respond with, like, I don't watch anime. I have no idea. What are you talking about? <laughs> Stop making up words. And I think that's, it's pretty important. And I wanted to share that with you, Nick. On today, okay. Best Friends Day. Yeah, I, I, I heard about that. Do, do we want to do anything Best to celebrate it? Um, I don't know. I, I'm not good at thinking of ideas. I'm not good at expressing intimacy in any way, shape, or form. But by humoring the idea, you are accepting that we are, of course, best friends. I'll, I'll accept it, yes. Sweet. Awesome. Best friends are like people that you send to do your dirty work, right? Uh, cronies it's just another term for it right yeah i'm pretty sure starscream and megatron are best friends <laughs> they're super besties <laughs> well you know no matter how many times they betray each other they do end up back together yeah know? that's so, the, yeah that's the perfect kind of relationship we've cracked the code of exactly. transformers finally that show makes sense to me after so long i was like why do they turn into cars and i just needed this one piece to finally connect all the little dots friendship that's why yeah oh, it's, like the fairy, it's like a fairy tale transformers crossover oh my what God. powers our transformation friendship all right i'm like what i thought it was the all spark the all spark is friendship i'm like wow this is really blowing my mind and also kind of destroying this universe is mystique in a little bit of a way oh god I almost launched into a fairy tale rant because of this week's chapter in that conversation too. <laughs> uh, oh. I sh I, I, real quick though, Nick, I also want to just note something. We completely neglected to even mention it. I guess just maybe it slipped both of our minds. Uh, Weekly manga recaps so over five years old now. We just we passed by yeah. our fifth year anniversary. Mm -hmm. We made a much uh, bigger I, deal I, about the I four year. I that back in April that we were creeping up on it, and then I completely forgot all last month. Yeah. So. <laughs> It didn't, yeah, I guess because we were doing, like, comedy month for April, and as soon as that was done, we are like, well, we don't have to do anything special for next month. It was fun. And, and then, also, we were pretty busy the whole month. So yeah. And then I, I looked at it, I was like, oh, yeah, that was five years. We made such a big deal out of four years. We didn't do anything for five years, which is a much bigger nope, milestone. Nope. Well, you know, we, co we covered the we covered JoJo and Pokemon in, in May. So, you know, our basically, like, our picks. The we're going to retroactively assume that was what our okay. birthday present to ourselves was. <laughs> ah, okay, I can take that then. Um, I don't have any um, silverware for you, though, which is apparently oh. what you're supposed to give on the fifth year anniversary. <laughs> it's the silverware anniversary, which doesn't sound very uh, 
romantic at all. If we're going to have to, like... Here you go, honey! I got you spoons! If we're going to stick to, like, traditional, like, marriage anniversary stuff for our podcast, then it's, it's going to be kind of awkward with my girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nick. Nick, all this is... Our, all, this is the... <laughs> all of our important anniversaries are going to follow a little bit after the podcast <laughs> anniversary. I'm like, Nick, this is the negligee anniversary. Here you go. <laughs> This is the one where we start doing really weird sex stuff. <laughs> this is when the podcast goes to the next level. Ugh. Uh, anyhow. Uh, we're gonna have to, uh, bring the mood back to... Way uh, down. Way down. Way to... We're gonna... I hope you guys enjoyed being happy, uh, from our jokey mood, uh, last few minutes, because I... for the next 30 to 40... We're going to be kind of sad. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed humor at the expense of what we're talking about, because I really don't know there's not a whole lot for the next little bit here. We'll, we'll see. Just we... guilt. But uh, a recommendation we took a couple of weeks ago was uh, Koido, Koino Kitachi, which uh, translates to the shape of the voice, or uh, as it is anglicized and dubbed, a silent voice, which more poetic sounding. Uh, basically... It, you never notice I seem to say that a lot whenever I start to explain stuff. <laughs> Basically, hey, we all have our little our uh, like our phrases, our our, our trademarks, mm -hmm. so to say, our habits. Yeah, once once you get it picked out though, or someone picks it out for you, then, then it's infuriating. You it. You're doomed to repeat so, it over and over. I didn't realize I did it until I worked at a Target, and one of my coworkers was like. You finish sentences with then a lot when you don't need to. It annoys the shit out of me. And I was like, what are you talking about? And ever since then, I always pick out when I say the word then at the end of a sentence. And I'm like, and it doesn't go, belong there. No! <laughs> I'm like, oh, Fat Sean was right! Then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's usually not even stuff that you even have to really feel guilty about. Like, it's not something that's particularly weird. But if you're just aware of it, and it's a little bit different... Then you get kind of self-conscious about it. Yes, and I fear I fear So basically, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this st story is about uh, bullying. It's about suffering. It's about failure to communicate more than anything else, because our main two characters uh, are these two people who one bullied the other when they were in elementary school. And now they have reunited in high school and the relationship between them is very different. And the hook is that one of the two, uh, Shoko, who is a girl, uh, or she gets called by her last name, Nishimiya, a lot. Nishimiya. Um, she is pretty much almost entirely deaf. Uh, she has hearing aids, they note so maybe she's not entirely deaf but she's very very close to being entirely deaf um she might be entirely deaf by the time that she's an adult because i don't think that they have her react to any sound whatsoever when she's a teenager whereas she does when she's a little girl at least some of them uh and her bully is shoya uh, and basically what happened when they were kids was Shoya was just a bright little kid who was trying to entertain himself and entertain his classmates, and he took to bullying Nishimiya, not out of a pure, like, hatred of her, but because a, b a bunch of the kids found her annoying because they kind of had to be pulled back a little bit so she could keep up, and instead of sticking together with her, they ostracized her a bit. And Ishida basically, for she was an acceptable target for him and so he started bullying her because people thought it was really funny and because she didn't object to it not because she wasn't suffering but because basically she was too nice to raise a real objection with him she didn't get really indignant she didn't cry she just kind of kept on trucking she smiled very positive smiling. and the story is told through uh, Sh Shoyo's eyes. So mm -hmm. we don't... You never see what her inner thoughts are. Mm -hmm. You just see she's always reacting to it with a smile, and all that does is anger Shoyo more. He because wants everyone thinks that she's creepy. Yeah. Uh, 
eventually, however, uh, after Nishimiya's been bullied a whole lot because she keeps on bringing home these broken uh, hearing aids, and so, of course, eventually her mother notices and complains. Uh, so this worker comes to the school, like this social worker, someone basically from, like, the Center for, like, deaf kids or kids with disabilities and says, look, we know that there's bullying going on here. Will one of you take responsibility for this? And the entire class points out Shoya, even though some of them not only encouraged his behavior, but sometimes even actively took part in it, including his jackass of a teacher, who is probably the most evil person in this entire series. <laughs> Which is strange, because he has some very big competition for that role at certain points. Mm -hmm. But yeah, th that teacher is a, a real shit. He's just an asshole. Like, you can understand most of the kids, because they're bratty kids, and some of them don't know better even when they're teenagers. But he's a fucking adult. And instead of trying to keep these kids in mind, eventually he's just like, well, obviously, you know, of course this was to be expected when they had that deaf girl here, that, you know, faulty child, basically. Yeah, like, there's there's a point where uh, Shoyo makes, like, a joke. I'm going to call him Mishida, because that's how I know him, and Shoyo and Shoko are too similar, so I'm going to mix those up all the time, so... Well, that's a deliberate, that's a deliberate choice. Their names yeah. Being so, but, yeah. But, uh, Ishida, like, makes a joke at one point, and the teacher like chuckles at it like a joke about Sho uh, Shoko and that's like something I could have technically kind of overlooked I'm like look right you now he's he's somebody who's finding humor in the world it's not evil to you know laugh at a joke at someone else's expense mm -hmm. but it's later on when he starts like referring to her as a, a like he's like I know it must have been so hard on you guys to have like a detriment in your class like this it's like what the fuck dude she's a person he, even, so even he saw her as a burden on the class and on him because he yeah. had to deal with a special needs kid. So, great teacher! <laughs> um, anyway, so as a result of this, Ishida suddenly becomes the target of bullying in the class. And it's, it's a very interesting sequence because for a while, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get that he's suddenly the target of bullying. He knows that his friends are acting kind of weird around him, but it takes a while for it to really sink in that basically he is the new Nishimiya. He's the target of all the bullying. And there is a really bad... Uh, he gets a reputation for having been a bully, so now it's, everyone feels justified in bullying and ostracizing him because he did do awful things to Nishimiya. Uh, but he is made to basically bear the burden of everyone's guilt and then up until he is in like his last or second to last year of high school just shuts himself off from everybody because nobody really wants to be his friend because everyone knows like oh he bullied that deaf girl when he was a kid you can't you shouldn't be his friend and stuff so that's really the first five chapters or so of the series told through flashback and then once that's over the rest of it is when they're teenagers because Ishida's had such a bad time in his life that he decides to kill himself. But before he does that, he's uh, he wants to set things in order. He wants to you know leave without having carrying any you know unresolved feelings with him. So uh, his mom had to pay for all of the hearing aids that he broke. Uh, so he earns enough money to pay her back. Uh, he tidies up his room so that it's you know all done and then he seeks out Nishimiya after learning sign language so that he can communicate with her and try and set things right a little bit he really just wants to talk with her for a little bit so he can say you know I'm sorry I'm gonna go now and kill myself yeah uh, what ends up happening however is instead Nishimiya kind of befriends him she's very excited that he's reconnecting with her because she hasn't seen evil. anyone from elementary school and she did have good good feelings and and good memories from the time that she had with them despite dealing with all of the bully and so over time the two of them get closer and Mishida of course you know, no longer wants to kill himself 
there's a really emotional scene where he apologizes to his mom because she figures out that was what he was thinking and he said and he promises on I, I won't do that again uh but the problem is he was counting on that being his escape from his messed up life and now he has to deal with it he still doesn't have any friends uh he doesn't have any direction for what he's really gonna do in his life because he was counting on killing himself and he still has that label of oh you bullied a deaf kid when you were a kid so how is he going to deal with that and how is he going to approach this his relationship with this girl whose childhood he essentially helped to ruin and that's just the start <laughs> yeah um this is uh it, it, it's going to be tough to make too many jokes about this sort of series because this is a series that, you know, has a, a real kind of story and message that's gained across. It's it's somewhat similar to, if you remember way back when we reviewed Bitter Virgin, which was another mm-hmm. series that had kind of a, a heavy subject matter that it takes very seriously. This is along the same lines, a little less severe because there are some things I could definitely be like, oh, it's kind of fucked up and weird. But it's a series that has to do with the, a lot of individuals who have a lot of sort of I guess the ramifications that came from these bullying acts and how these these different roles that everyone played within that relationship how all of them have a lot of self-loathing for themselves afterwards and you know the the crux of it is Ishida how he feels bad for you know ruining Ishimiya's life for you know how he's been bullied and completely alienated from everybody how he, you know, hurt his mom so much and made her cry, um, all these sorts of things, and he, you know, was attempt uh, going to attempt suicide, and now he's, you know, trying to figure out what to do, and there's he doesn't know really what to do. He he sees everyone around him, all of his classmates, with X's over their faces. It's a stylistic choice of the series, because those are people when he can't see their face that he isn't really looking at. You know, he doesn't see them. He. he doesn't feel there's any kind of mutual connection or anything like that between them and it it sort of creates this interesting state where he's he starts having to branch out and connect with other people and try to start building a life so it's you know a very emotionally heavy series you you mentioned it now i'm not going to get into spoilers too much yet but um the scene where his mother kind of confronts him about this uh his attempted suicide is one of the hardest series or one of the hardest scenes in the series for me to get through because it's it's so brutal. It's like, oh, you know, uh, his mom's a single mom. You don't really know what happened to the dad until the very end. You know, she's been raising two kids on her own. And she's been dealing with such a, sh- you know, uh, not a shitty kid, uh, a kid with a lot of issues, you know, a whole bunch as a, throughout the start of the series. And there's a scene, like, within the first three or four chapters where... Um, she goes to apologize to Nishimiya's mother on behalf of her son. And you don't see how that conversation goes. You do see Nishimiya's mom walking by, though, and she catches sight of Ishida, and she just looks at him, and she says this remark that's like, I can't remember exactly, but I'm paraphrasing, uh, you have the same thuggish face as her, or something like that, you know? Basically saying that she looked at his mom and saw her in kind of derogatory way, like she was also kind of like a a brute or something like that and it like broke my heart because i'm like oh his mom's so nice i oh you can't do it like had i been in that situation i would have been like all right first and foremost i'm punching nishimiya's mom because you don't talk to my mom that way and then two i'm going to hurl myself down the river because clearly my mother deserves something better she doesn't deserve a son like me so maybe otters will pick me up and perhaps i'll be a better otter son i don't know but uh i, I couldn't i couldn't imagine putting my mother through that kind of uh that kind of turmoil well, and, I mean, Nishimiya's mother actually serves as a great way to segue into this, which is one of the primary themes of the series, which is illustrated by the fact that Nishimi is deaf. Uh, communication between people is not always very easy. Uh, Nishimiya's mother, of course, is trying to look out for her kids. And so... It makes sense that, you know, when she looks at Shoya's mom, all she can see is the mother of the kid who bullied my daughter. Mm. It makes sense that whenever Shoya is trying to kind of make amends, she's not willing to forgive him. And she has this really great line that she tells him 
after she slapped him probably the fifth time or something like that, because every time he, show, he shows up in front of her, wow. There's a lot of slapping in this series. This is a violent series, surprisingly. Uh, she just says, my daughter will never get back the happy childhood that you took away from her. She can never have that. She doesn't know exactly what's best for her kids, but she's doing what she thinks is right, because she is also on her own. Their dad isn't around. Uh, she's looking after them. She's got to be away from them a whole lot and leave them in the care of her mother. Uh, and so she's trying to raise two kids with one job. And so despite the fact that uh, Yuzuru, Nishimiya's little sister, uh, resents her, it makes sense because she does. they don't understand each other. They don't really understand why each of them are doing certain things and they have dis different approaches on how they should treat Nishimiya and what they should do about her and for example uh, their mother refuses to learn sign language she just wants their family to basically be normal whereas that's not the best for Nishimiya you know she needs help she needs people to be able to actually communicate with her and just think about that like she can't effectively communicate with her own daughter despite the fact that she's trying to look out for her in a very cruel world. It's not but even that's... that. It, uh, Shoko can't communicate with any of her family because she discourages anyone from learning sign language. Yeah, she says, don't don't use sign language at the table. Don't use it at the house. Don't do it. Yeah. So, so you know, Shoko's shit out of luck on that. She has to kind of rely on what limited hearing she can or her book. And she has a, she carries a notebook with her that she writes down on, and she uses that to communicate with people. And even some people are unwilling to use that. They use that as method to bully her and like, oh no, just say it, just just say it. Why can't you say it? Come on, use your mouth. It's like she can't. She's deaf, you asshole. But people don't get that. There's reasons for all of these sorts of things too. Why people are the way they are in this series is usually explained in a pretty sort of a sad way. And what it comes down to is the fact that a big ser theme of the series is just miscommunication. People don't understand each other because they can't peer inside each other's minds. And the manga plays with that a bit because the grand majority of the series is seen through Shoya's eyes. Uh, through Ishida's eyes, I should say. There are a few scenes that are where, of course, he's not around. And so there's some other, you know, it's like, you know, just third person perspective. But in general, for most of it, He's the only character whose like mind we see inside of. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the perspective character up until towards the end, when pretty much every important character gets their own chapter explaining this is what this character's been going through yeah. through their own perspective, and that's critical for the series because all these characters who you haven't really gotten throughout this entire time, all of a sudden there's this explanation and it makes more sense and it's you know the same events in the series play a different way and it's not like they ever explain themselves fully to each other there's one character who's got some really dark inner thoughts whereas he's always kind of almost this idealistic sort of heroic character through most of it and he never explains like oh no this is how I actually feel about these things uh, but that's the point you know you don't understand everything when you're in real life. Like you and I get along pretty darn well, but there are some things that you have never said to me. And some things I've never said to you that are probably never going to come up. And if we each knew those things, we would probably see each other differently. I killed so, a man in France last year, Nick. Well, that I knew about. I helped you bury the body. Oh, that's right. You were there. Who haven't I yeah. told about the police? That's who I haven't told about that. Yet. Oh, all right. okay. yeah, it's all coming together now. Okay, everyone in the chat room, don't tell the hops about that, right? Okay. All right. I think you promise. Okay. <laughs> they were so good about that last week. Um, that's really it. Uh, it's a really powerful series. Um, it's, it's especially at certain points. And at times it's a very... It's a very surprising series at points because it deals with some things that I, I really haven't seen sometimes ever but usually just, you know, not very often in manga uh it deals with uh familial abandonment really really morosely uh but realistically 
Um, there is one side character. This is just like a background character. They never really do anything. Uh, Ishida's sister. Yeah. Um, we never see her face. Uh, she's basically just this background character. She's a lot older than Ishida. And we kind of see through a child's eyes. Because uh, the first time we see her is when Ishida's still in elementary school while the bullying's going on. And he makes me like, oh yeah, man, my sister's got a new boyfriend and stuff. Oh, hey, how you doing, you know? And then eventually, uh, she just goes through a bunch of boyfriends who keep on leaving her. Um, so, presumably, she's just promiscuous, promiscuous. But then, eventually, we meet uh, Maria, uh, who is his niece, and is very obviously half black. <laughs> <laughs> she's Brazilian, <laughs> yes. Uh, because um, one she of married boys... Pedro. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, where it's like, oh, well, that's nice. She finally found a guy who would stick around with her. Good. <laughs> but other than you know this cute little you know half black half Japanese kid walking around being you know adorable and five years old, um, there's no real point to it other than that. It's just that oh yeah, there was this character who you know kind of had bad luck with men. She didn't ha find good boyfriends up until she did. That's it, you know. Um, and, but it's little details like that that I really appreciated because it made the the series it made the you know world seem more real real that these people just had freaking bad luck at times or problems that you could buy as real. Um, I'm trying to think what I can really talk about with Gout Game and uh, spoil spoilers thing. or anything like that. Um, I I, I we... like. We could talk about some of the characters before getting into spoilers. Because um, they should, well, show up. We should also probably, I think, give like a general consensus and get into spoilers. Because it's going to be tough to talk about characters too much without getting into some spoilers without then repeating okay. ourselves okay. when spoilers come around. Um, I, I'll just say, I think this series is, you know, extremely well written at times. Um, it's a relatively quick series to read too. Once you get past like the first like five or so chapters, everything's very quick and you know kind of blazes through. Um, one issue I did have with it was the chapter structure was a bit odd. Um, at points you'd go from one chapter to the next, and there was a period of time that just kind of got skipped, mm -hmm. or it would start rather with two pages from the last chapter, and then would start the new content, which I'm sure was very helpful when you're reading it week by week. But, you know, now the series is complete, you can read it all, like, on Crunchyroll, like I did. If you're going through it in that way, it gets kind of confusing when you're like, wait, didn't I just go through this page? Like, oh, right, I'm new chapter, sort of thing. It's a bit on that way. It's a minor complaint overall in the grand scheme of things, but something I did just want to kind of note in case that is a big issue for some people. Um, I, I like the series a lot. I I, I don't love it. I, I There's some things that I wish the series had done, Um but I absolutely will recognize that this is one of the better written series um, that we've done in the show. I, I recognize that it touches on a topic that I hadn't really put a lot of thought into, and it absolutely has scenes that are going to, you know, make you stop to think, I think. Um, and definitely just some scenes that are emotionally just heartbreaking. So to all that, I'd say it's, it's a great recommendation. But if you're like, I don't like being sad. <laughs> I want action. <laughs> are there battles in it? And I'm like, well, for two chapters, kind of, but... <laughs> Outside of that, if that's not your thing, you know, this isn't going to be the series for you. But if you like dramas, if you like kind of, um, you know, a, a strong narrative, if you like sort of talking about serious issues uh, or serious matters, and I think all that, it does very well. The, the thing that I, the way that I would sum this series up is uh, it's got fantastic characters, but there are problems with certain parts of the plot that I have. Uh, I think that, in general, the way that the story plays out is very, very good. But there are some details, particularly towards the end, where I kind of found myself asking, well, why'd you do that? Uh, for example, there's this thing about a movie that basically they're, they're trying to make an amateur film uh, throughout a large chunk of the, of, the, of the series. And it's kind of made to be more important than I think it actually is. Yeah, I was like, that movie blows. Well, that's <laughs> I was not... right there up there with that, that super douchey critic. Well, that's not really the, you know, the point that I have about it, but it's sort of built up to be this 
making the film is built to be this important thing and i think that if it had gone uncompleted i wouldn't have really cared one way or the other something just fell off my desk uh Ghosts. and uh, so when they did build it up i mean it's i think they focused a little bit too much on it without they they focused too much and too little on it the I film isn't as important as i think it you know as it wants you to believe it is i understand what it was going for but it didn't quite match up my my feelings on it. and the ending i think i understand why they did the ex- the ending the way that they did uh but it's too open ended for my for my liking you and also it ends on another Maybe they got together note, which I fucking hate. <laughs> it, it would have been a nice series to have, actually a very important series to, I think, have given us a flash forward kind of ending, like five years into the future to see where these characters are. Because it ends, you know, I guess mild spoiler, but it ends in, you know, within the same year that it starts. So for a series that had a lot to do with self-loathing um suicide um people constantly feeling like they're not worth anything it'd been nice to have seen them five years later and be like oh they're okay that's good (laughs) because you don't you get the idea at some point where you're like all right well this character's okay right now what's going to happen when they're not surrounded by this group of people or you know things like that so as a little flash forward i think would have been really nice Maybe it would have felt, maybe it would have felt like too fairy tale ish, uh, like not 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 t a t a i l but t a l e, uh, you know. And they and then everything was happy because that's not really I think the point of it. Mm-hmm. But for something that is supposed to be about overcoming those negative thoughts about you know yourself and other people, yeah. Especially considering it, it ends on the note of, and now the rest of their lives are ahead of them. It would have been nice to have a little bit of assurance of, and they were good lives. <laughs> well, even like, um, I think it was in Bitter Virgin where there was like a note in the final chapter where the main character's like, yeah, we're together. This probably won't last like most high school relationships don't, but it's okay. It still ends on a happy note, but there's also a note that's like, look, everything doesn't end like a fairy tale or things like that. I think you could have put some realism in there while still giving us the impression that there's at least happiness within this conclusion in this moment. It ends on, how do I describe it? It ends on a note of, and now the rest of their lives are ahead of them. Mm -hmm. They literally at graduation. They, they, they've graduated from high school now the rest of their lives are ahead of them well but how long are their lives <laughs> do they make they, it <laughs> do, do, does the Sheeta ever stop being a dumbass and realize Nishimiya loves him <laughs> or any of the girls that like him do uh yeah anyway I guess we'll head into more in-depth character analysis and spoiler warnings then because there's more to say about some of these characters, there's especially the main ones for that matter. There are a lot of spoilers. Uh, so, again, if you want to check out the series, you, you didn't read it before our recommendation, hearing us talk about it has intrigued you, this is the point where you'll want to stop listening and uh, go read it again. You can get it on Crunchyroll if you have a subscription to that. You can get the entire series on there. It's a very quick series to read. I think the print volumes are also out, so you might be able to pick those up. But I'm the not... latest volume just came out, okay. like at the beginning of the month. So you can uh, pick up the so... entire thing in whatever f- format you uh, you uh, go to. And also, there's going to be an animated movie coming out yes. later this year. And an anime, I think, or is the anime already out? And no, it's an anime film. Is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so go check that out. And if you are one of those people that are going to go, you know, pop out, and you don't want spoilers. Uh, we do time codes now, so I won't try to give you an estimate. Just, you know, if you're listening on iTunes or whatever, it's in the description. Just skip ahead to that time, and uh, then we'll be talking about Black Clover. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, so, uh, suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Nishimiya tries to commit it, and it's very sad. <laughs> this, this is where I think uh, how it's it's tough to talk about spoilers without getting the, uh, you know, characters without getting spoilers. Right? I spoke mm-hmm. there. Um, the character of Nishimiya is one who, at the start of it, I was kind of like, 
this character's a little bit unrealistic, don't you think? Like, she's not angry at all about this kid. She's, for... she's, she's almost perfect. Yeah, you're she's like, constantly smiling. like, not for nothing, but wouldn't you be a little angry? Until you finally get into her life a little bit, and you understand what her thought process is, and the entire time, she's always believed she was the one who was fucking things up. She has this horrible amount of self-loathing because she believes that she constantly ruins things around her. And there's this chapter, it's honestly a shitty chapter, but the moment in it is great, uh, where we find out about this note that she wrote to Ueno, which is another one of uh, Ishida's friends. She writes this note to her that essentially details everything she feels about herself and her kind of conclusions on stuff. And, and it almost sounds like it was written by a robot. It's, it's... You know, 20 chapters later, we find out what's in it. And it's, you know, a lot of heartbreaking kind of analysis. Because the way she's sort of phrased, she's like, you know, I'm always the last one to know what's going on when things are happening. You know, sometimes I don't even know what people are talking about at the time. So I I smile and nod as like a neutral expression so I don't make people angry. Because I know that I'm always dragging people down. I know I'm always ruining things for them. It's a very depressive sad way that she looks at her entire life and the entire world around her and like the response that she gets for that and this all happens after she just tried to commit suicide and Shida gets hurt saving her and she then just gets very tense very tense sequence too yeah very realistic honestly because uh she doesn't realize that Shida has followed her or shown up in her apartment and she's gonna jump off of the building and Ishida you know, races over as she's, you know, jumped over the railing and he grabs her arm. But, um, like, his legs are already hurt from when he fell early, earlier in the day and he's not Superman. So he's, like, you know, wedged himself in the rail and he's trying to pull her up. Um, and they hurt themselves just from the act of her, him catching her. Very, very realistic, and basically he only barely managed to hold on long enough for her to like get a grip on the on the railing next to him, and then he ends up tumbling over the rail himself. Very scary. Yeah, it's it's a pretty heavy chapter, and it's it's done pretty thematically of of getting it while a festival's going on, so it's night and you see fireworks going off in the background. It has the makings of a really huge chapter, and it kind of you know in the moment you feel it comes out of nowhere. Because for the first time, it actually seems like she's happy. Like, she seems like she's a little bit happier about things. She's starting to kind of, like, give a, you know, give the impression that maybe she's getting more comfortable. Her entire family has gotten more comfortable with Ishida. Like, his mom actually allows him to come with them to this. And usually she's been very cold about things. They seem like they're making progress. Goes home to the apartment to go get uh, something for Yuzuro. And then she's at the window, and you're like, holy shit, like, this... You know, and it makes sense once you find out what kind of mental state she's at, where she's been at. It, it all makes sense. It's just a very tragic kind of scene, and it's done, you know, extremely effectively. Uh, but yeah, but once we get uh, Nauka, who I know's uh, response to the letter, uh, it's, Ishida is in the hospital in a coma from the injuries he suffered saving Nishimiya, and Nauka, who is in love with Ishida, uh, but is a huge bitch. <laughs> Dude, she goes, she just like blames Nishimiya entirely for what's happened. And she's like screaming in her face over and grabbing her by the hair and slapping her and punching her. Oh, she's beating the shit again. out of her. The reason I hate and... that, that those chapters ultimately is because for two chapters, it felt like a battle manga because <laughs> it's like, it's like six straight panels of fucking like Awako, like just beating the shit out of her closed fist. At which point, the end of the chapter is Nishimiya's mom flying out of the fucking nowhere to slap her. And then, like, half of the next chapter is Nishimiya's mom just beating the shit out of Ueno, which is satisfied as all hell. But I was like, holy shit, this is so much violence. <laughs> but, you know, Naoka's note to Nishimiya is, like, didn't you ever stop and think about how the people around you would, you know, feel if you killed yourself? You know, and it's it's because of you that he is in that hospital room. But of course, that doesn't help Nishimiya. She just thinks, oh, it's my fault that he's hurt. And it was, I didn't, I messed something up again. And there's this absolutely heartbreaking chapter. Uh, basically, at the end, like I said, every important character gets their own point yes. of view chapter to explain what their mental state through the series has been. And Nishimiya's is 
heartbreaking because the first half of it or so is a dream that she's having where she imagines life if she could hear and everyone's dialogue is messed up it's the way that Nishimiya would say stuff because of course she doesn't actually know what stuff sounds like so she's trying to imagine it and she can't quite get it right so everyone's words are a little bit distorted and it's so she imagines choice. and so she imagines what life would be like uh, and so she imagines, oh, if Ishida teased her by doing what he did before, you know, making, you know, like barking sounds behind her in class, but then she would just turn around and be like, oh, stop that. You know, don't do it again. You know, I'll be mad. Or, you know, and then their chorus in school singing together and everyone getting along properly because she can actually sing properly. And the thing that really, really got me was just her with a bunch of friends and her family and her dad's there because her dad. When her dad away. abandoned them because she was deaf. Um, and she imagines them all sitting together and watching TV and her just, you know, turning to someone and going, this is a really nice song. And like, oh! Oh, I guess she can't listen to music! <laughs> the, the the stuff that hit me the hardest, there was... Uh, her little sister, I think, is a fantastic character, user. Oh, yeah, user. Um, the amount of sacrifice that this girl has kind of put into herself for the benefit of her sister, how dedicated she is to her... And there's this nice long con where we know that she doesn't go to school or anything like that. And she spends a lot of her time just kind of taking pictures. And we find out later on she takes pictures of dead things, you know, corpses, essentially. Um, and then hangs them around the house. And, you know, it's kind of like a morbid thing that their family stares at all the time. But we find out the reason why she does that. And it's another great chapter. I think it comes actually relatively around that same point. Um, we find out what... Uh, Shoko had said to her because they were the, the essentially before she got transferred there was one day where she came home crying and that was sort of the last time they interacted and she said something to use and we don't know what it is and you find out and in that moment she said I wish I was dead so said, I hate myself yeah I want to die I want to die so Yuzuru has been constantly putting pictures of dead things around the house and like in her attempt to kind of discourage her and this is after the suicide attempt, and all three of them are kind of inside the kitchen as Yuzuru is, like, taking down the photos. She's like, I don't know why I thought that would work. And it's just, like, it, it was just heartbreaking to kind of see that that effort was going into it and just... She wanted, she wanted uh, Nishimiya to see how horrible death was by taking this picture of these corpses and hanging them around the house. And so, you know, her mom is like, oh, why are you taking those down? She said, because the only reason I took them all was to that I, because I thought that she would be disgusted by death and not want to kill herself. And now I realize it was pointless. So yeah. she just, so the two of them just, you know, go around the house while they're crying, taking these pictures down. I, sh I should note, by the way, we. Uh, I think if you don't know what's happening, you might sound like this series is nothing but depression. It's not. I also like Yuzuru because she's a funny character and she's a lot of yeah. like high energy and, and pretty it's, goofy. It, well, it's great because like when she's first introduced, they explain later on that um, because a recurring thing, Ishida's mother is a stylist, um, and haircuts are are a thing that gets brought up a few a number of times. Uh, most importantly, Nishimiya's mother wanted her daughter to get her hair cut super short so that she would look like a boy because she thought if she looked like a boy that she would look tougher and kids would you know, maybe leave her alone. But Nishimiya didn't want to do that. She wanted to have a cute hairstyle. So Yuzuru instead was like, I'll keep my hair short. I'll be the tough one so that you know, I can protect her. And she goes around looking like a boy most of the time. And so when Ishida first approaches Nishimiya, uh, user goes to him and he's like, I'm her boyfriend. We take baths together. Yeah, that's my girl. And so she, and so she just like, uh, uh, oh, okay. And he just walks off like, I guess Nishimi is just into into younger guys. I guess <laughs> this totally buys it. <laughs> he's like, I guess she just likes dudes who look like they're eight. Okay, fair enough. I've read, Aki, I've read Akisora. I, yeah. I buy it. <laughs> Learning that they were related later, which is like, I've read Akisora, I buy it. And yeah, uh, speaking of comic relief, uh, Nagatsuka is one of my favorite characters in this series. <laughs> He's just this, this chubby little kid that Ishida helps out one day, almost on a whim. 
he sees Nagatsuka being bullied, and at this point, you know, he just, you know, he sees X's over every classmate's face. But and on a whim, because the guy's like, oh, you know, give me your bike, so I, you know, I'm going to borrow it. And she is like, here, just take my bike instead. And then later on, Nagatsuka actually goes and finds it for him, and at that point, they're, they're just friends. But Nagatsuka is very defensive of his friendship with Ishida, and he's got all this energy surrounding him, and he's he's just a really funny character, I feel like. Um, he provides a lot of really much needed comic relief, and then when he's sad, it's even more sad, because that's the kind of series this is. Um, You're alone on Nagatsaka. I fucking hated him. You hate him? He, he started to grow on me a little bit, but he's such an asshole. I completely... There's a, it got linked to us, but there's a, an English interview with the uh, manga cut from this where she talks a little bit about the series and some good, very good insight into it. Mm-hmm. But she mentioned she's like, I don't like Nagatsuka. I mean, he's mostly just me, like at my most silliest, but I would not be <laughs> friends with him if he was a real person. <laughs> well, maybe that's why I kind of, <laughs> why I kind of appreciate him though, it was because like, I, and she, in that same interview, she also she she notes um, a lot of characters in the series fans don't like they just think of them as villains and she says well neither of them are, not, none of them are actually evil people and that's one of the things about you know the miscommunication is you know people don't understand each other so you only get one half of the story so people like Nauka and uh, Kawai uh, who I hate more than Nauka by the way <laughs> um, they were part of, you know, this class that bullied uh, Nishimiya, and then later on, they're both kind of awful people for vastly different reasons. Uh, but they've got their own way of seeing the world. It's a wrong way of seeing the world and seeing their relationship with Ishida, with Nishimiya, with everyone in their class. But there's a reason why they act the way that they do and why they think that their actions are justified. And that's, a, you know, a really important part of the series. Um, Kawhi's big thing is that she has a is that she's little Miss Perfect, and she thinks that life is a drama film. I think because <laughs> she'll give these big dramatic speeches and be like, "Come on, let's all get together, everyone!" And she's but she's just a manipulative bitch. She's strangely uh, selectively evil. Like she just seems to selectively forget a lot of things that that were bad that she did. And only seems to apologize in very, like, half-bursts. Like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, but, but you're a you bitch! Were... I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. We all have to work together to overcome this. As opposed to, I fucked up and only me. <laughs> uh, she gives this, like, big dramatic speech at the end. Like, her chapter to explain herself really did not do a whole lot to make me get her. Because she basically was she just hears some people talking shit about her in class because she's a little miss perfect and they're like why is she trying to be such a perfect girl is she just doing it because that one she wants that one guy to get with her and stuff why who does she think that she's fooling and then she goes now i know what kind of treatment ishida and nishimiya went through when they were bullied now you don't i know the fucking half of it now i know what it's like to be bullied it's like people were just spreading rumors about her. It's not like they fucking drew on her desk or wrecked her hearing aids or whatever. <laughs> planted planted plants in her shoes. <laughs> um, and then, uh, I really like Nagatsuka, like I was saying. He's definitely got his faults, mostly because he's got an ego to him. But at the least, he's really the one guy who's constantly looking out for Ishida until they have a really big disagreement. And even that has a point to it because they get into a disagreement over a really stupid thing. And at least this really cool moment that I like where they resolve things very easily and Ishida just, they're kind of getting back together. They're working on this film that Nagatsuka's trying to make and they start getting back to work and all of a sudden Ishida just starts crying without realizing it. And everyone's like, are you okay? What's what's going on? And she just thinks to himself, I had forgotten what it was like to argue with somebody for no reason because I haven't had a friend like that in such a long time that I could have that kind of relationship with. Um, that's probably why I like it. He's kind of like, he's basically like Ishida's rock, even though Ishida doesn't appreciate him all the time. 
he's constantly looking out for them because he treasures their friendship so much. And he does, I do, I do really like some of the moments that he has that are comedic. Um, like, for example, uh, when Now is first introduced back into the story, she tries to leave a confession for Ishida, but it ends up in Nagatsuka's things instead. So Nagatsuka gets in and is like, that cute girl confessed to me! And Ishida's like, oh yeah, way to go, man! <laughs> Great job, bro! And so he goes to meet her, and she's like, no, you fat little ugly piece of shit! It's not for you, it's for Ishida! And he's like, I knew that. I was just testing you, and now I've seen the type of person you are, so I know you're not good for him. He is funny uh, at times. I, I can definitely agree with that. He has his moments. Uh, but probably the most interesting side character for, you, for me was probably Mashiba, um, who is he's introduced into the oh. story very suddenly. Yeah, I, uh, I need to ask: Did I miss a chapter? Because I stopped reading one night. I was like, all right, 26 chapters is enough. I'm going to stop. The next chapter, oh, like, they were in a fucking amusement park, and he had met his old classmate, and there was just this dude hanging out with the group. I was like, who is this? I picked up right where I left off. Where? Who there are you? Scene. There is a scene where Mashiba just kind of randomly comes over to Ishida, and is just like, hey, Ishida, how you doing, basically? Um, it's after the... Is she a jumping into the river scene gets released? The picture that user yeah. took gets put online. And essentially that makes Ishi to stand out a little bit. And we're led to believe that Mashima just kind of notices him because of that. And so he just decides to start hanging out with him. And during the course of the series, Ishida gets really uneasy around him because Mashiba, you know, brings up a couple of times, I really hate bullies. I really hate when little kids are bullied. And I it's fight, because I I beat up bullies. Well, he almost does. There's this. He's, no, he's things. like legitimately. Any time there's a bully, he threatens to fight them, or uh, put some kind of aggressive action against them. There's this really cool scene where he they walking along and they see this you know fat little girl getting bullied by her classmates. They're like, "You hold our bags." He's like, well, "I don't want to hold your bags. Do it, just do it." And so he goes over to her and he takes the bags from her and he throws one backpack really loudly on the ground. He just throws the rest of the bags at the kids and he just says, "Carry your own backpacks." And that's that's it. Like he he he'll go hardcore on on, on an elementary schooler's ass. Uh, he hates bullying so much. Then he learns about you know he, they meet with the Ishida's teacher at one point, and he throws his drink in the guy's face because he learns about how he mistreated uh, about how he's talking about Nishimiya. Um, and Ishida's getting really uneasy around the guy because he's thinking to himself, "What if this guy finds out what an awful person I was when I was a kid?" Um, and then when everything comes out, you know, there's this big, you know, fight between the entire group and, you know, Ishida's really upset. He's really depressed. And he's like, things are going to go back to the way they were. I'm going to be all by myself. And he says to Mashiba, you said that you would, you know, punch whoever you found out bullied Nishimi when she was a kid. Well, it was me. So if you still want to hit me, then hit me. And Mashiba punches him in the head and he walks away. And then later on, we find out that Mashiba is kind of really messed up it's in the head. Kind of a head. sociopath a little bit. He's a little bit. Uh, it turns out that when he was bullied, he just got really resentful towards everyone. He talks about, he comes off as being this you know cool kid now, but he really thought of himself as being this weird outsider. And the reason if we reached out to Ishida was because, well, this guy is even weirder than me. Maybe if I associate with him, I'll seem normal by comparison. And it apparently worked because he's like one of the most popular guys in the class by like the end of the story. And he also talks about, oh, you know, I want to help kids. I want to, you know, help them out. And it's this really dark reveal where he, because he hears about some classmates are, you know, already having kids and he thinks to himself, you know, if I become their teacher, I'll get to look after their kids and I'll go get to look after them and see their every mistake and see what kind of person they become. And it's like, Jesus Christ. Are you like, yeah, are you going to take this kid? <laughs> and, you know, it start. it's the, when he first talks about it, he's like, you know, I thought about it and I was like, you know, I'd really like to, you know, be a teacher, you know, look after, you know, my old classmates, kids. And now it's like, I'd really like to be a teacher and look after my old classmates' kids. <laughs> it's such a noble goal that he explains in the most terrifying way. 
But a really interesting character. I honestly wish that the had gotten to do a little bit more. <laughs> but uh, some, re- like I said when, right before we talked about, uh, got more into the characters. I like the characters in this story. I think more than I like the plot itself at, at times. Uh, a lot of them have really good moments. I just think that the way that everything unfolds by the end left me a little bit wanting. Uh, but some really good characters. I really do did like a lot of what they got to do. And uh, really like the series overall. I like the series a lot. As I said, I, I think there are some moments that are absolutely just hard hitting. Uh, almost every scene with uh, Ishida's mom is heartbreaking. I'm going to talk about Sahara. Damn she's, it. She's, uh, she, those moments are, are painful. Even like a scene where she visits her son in the hospital and she can't really say anything to Shoko. You know, initially it's sad too because she first thinks that the reason he got hurt was he was trying to do something. Like, she assumes he was at fault and is starting to apologize to Nishimiya's mom until Nishimiya and uh, Shoko both, like, you know, bow down and apologize. And it's heartbreaking stuff there. Um, I, I liked a lot of the development we got. I, I did just wish, and this is a series that's, you know, it's very well written. It, you know, I believe there's actually some sort of accredi- uh, accreditation to the national hearing impaired society in japan to it like there was, yeah. there was some kind of like actual consultation to this series to kind of give it some realism you know the, the mangaka i guess actually had family who work you know with the hearing impaired so it's got you know a lot of authenticity to it in that regard um but one thing i really wish they had done for a series that dealt so heavily with depression and suicide and self-loathing i really had wished therapy and or professional help of some kind had been mentioned at the end because essentially everyone is like wow that movie was great let's connect with one another and then seemingly all of our problems are solved and you're like maybe for one or two of you this led to a big thing but there are a couple of these characters who i'm like they yeah, have yeah, like deeper seated psychological issues that really do need professional help because this is you know not going to be a, a permanent fix I mean, you know, you could say, like, oh, Nagatsuka will be okay, you know. Uh, but uh, let's go over the way that this unfolded for a couple of people, yeah. Uh, Ishida nearly died. Uh, Nishimiya com- attempted to commit suicide. Her family dealt with tremendous grief and hardship, so did Ishida's mom. Uh, Naoka is obviously disturbed, uh, because, and she got into a fight with two members of you know the fam- the girl's family that tried to commit suicide uh so clearly there are at least five people who really 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 should seek help in this or at least should have people check up on them it's you know, just 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 to be safe it's know? just that sense of like look talking and out connecting with other people that stuff's great but some of these things are legitimate you know, psychological issues that you need therapy to work through. And it's not something that you're just going to be able to talk to somebody who you're friends with. Like, getting closure, all that stuff, awesome. But you need help and you might need medication because there might be imbalances and stuff like that going on. Like, you know, the best way to fight depression isn't just to hash it out with some buddies over a movie, you know? Mm-hmm. It's that sort of thing. Where I wish that had happened and I'd have been like, because that's why I'm so concerned at the end of the series when there's no, like, here they are five years later. I'm like, look, when all these characters stop hanging around each other, do those thoughts keep creeping back in? Because coming from somebody who has a lot of self-loathing and Catholic guilt door, I know that those thoughts don't really go away. So that was just my thought process on things. You know, if instead of, and now the rest of our lives are ahead of us, maybe even in the series with everyone still going to class and just have a note that's like... Occasionally, Nishimiya sees a therapist now. Occasionally, Ishida sees a therapist or something like that. It doesn't... I don't, I'm not even like saying, like, oh, Mish, every, like, every character needs to, but it's, like, it's not brought up at all. Right. It's And it's, it, I'm agreeing with you. It's not something that necessarily yeah. needs to be explored and be a focus. You know, can, can dedicate a, a, a scene per chapter until the rest of the... Uh, until <laughs> yeah. the end of the series doing this. I'm just saying even a throwaway line would have been reassuring in that case. Because, like you said, yeah, there is no confirmation that everything's going to be okay. And so, depending on your mindset, 
and your level of cynicism, uh, then you could very well interpret, well, there's no guarantee of a happy ending for these people. And maybe that is the point. Maybe because maybe there's not supposed to be a note of, you know, everything's going to be okay now. It would be nice to have that reassurance after what you put me through, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's even if that was the point, though, it's still like a anti-point in a way because there's still real no real suggestion that's even what the series is kind of going for you know if you're gonna if you're gonna end it on that note that everybody's seeming to get closure for what happened when they were kids and they're they're moving on you know it's it's good to also note like hey you know this stuff doesn't really end here it's not like one good group powwow kind of ended all that angst and concern and by the way why are why don't Nishimi and Nishida get together and have kids? God damn it! I yeah. want a happy ending. Why is it Pedro in the series more? I wanted more of the Brazilian step or brother-in-law. Pedro was the only of his sister's boyfriends that had his back. He was cool. <laughs> the only other one we met beat the shit out of him. Because what an asshole that dick was. Just uh. because Nishida beat up his little brother. <laughs> So I mean, look, guys. I I think, I, I think the ending still has a lot of good merits to it. I'm not, you know, saying anything bad about it or anything. I don't. I'm not saying I needed the ending to have every piece of closure. I didn't need to know where they go step by step through life. I think it just would have been nice to have noted that within the series at some point. Um, it, it's just a, a thing on my end. I, I still really like this series overall. I don't love it as much as i think some people do but you know that might just be because i have small you know quibbles here and there about it but i still can recognize it's a fantastically written series there are good characters in it the emotional moments in it are just you know like they can punch you in the gut and then some scenes they'll rip your heart out and then some scenes they'll just make you laugh you know it's a very good series of kind of hooking you it's fast it's easy to read i, I enjoyed it and there's some stylistic choices you know the x is over the face or that chapter that's primarily done as though uh, how Nishimi herself talks it's brilliant they were just fantastic chapters so all that stuff I think is really well done um, so again if you're into dramas if you're into that sort of stuff absolutely go check this series out it's a great recommendation it's good it's got a really good mix of characters that encompass a pretty broad array of different issues and also, you know, some that are just kind of normal. Yeah, uh, um, Sahara we didn't talk about. Sahara we didn't talk about. She's the one person, like, you definitely don't need therapy. Like, you were barely involved in this. <laughs> she's got she's got her own hang-ups and stuff, but they're in a very relatable, normal way. Mm -hmm. Because she was like, you know, oh, I could have you know, really helped out Nishimi, and I have guilt over that. But it's, she's not crippled by it. She just kind of quietly is like i'm just gonna try and be a better person i'm gonna try and be better tomorrow than i was today and i'm gonna try and do that in every as aspect of my life and the way i treat people and the way i work on my skills and stuff and she's the one that you feel the least worried about by <laughs> yeah. the end of it so that's kind of what i mean i that's kind of why i skipped over her she definitely does still have issues but there's a great moment where she gets mocked because she's wearing heels and she's not used to wearing heels and she says I'm wearing them so that I'll get used to wearing them you know she's not concerned for, with the way that she is now she's just trying to improve herself and that's a really admirable thing and that's what I like about the cast in general is there are all these different relatable characters at different ends of things and it's understandable why they don't quite all get together is because they're so different and yeah. communication is important it's very effective series in terms of conveying that absolutely now with that said uh i did not fail to communicate but i did fail to read black clover ahead of time for this week <laughs> let's hit the recap portion of the manga recap for nick's first ever blind read through of black clover Ooh, this is exciting page 64 the pointlessly direct fireball and the wild lightning one of those is a much better name than the other <laughs> I'm the wild lightning, and I'm the pointlessly direct fireball. <laughs> Why would you call yourself that? So, Luck and Magna are facing off against Beast Magic Dude, as they were at the end of the last chapter. They're both very beaten up, but Luck 
is still very excited about the battle, and he's like, oh, come on, beat us up some more. And man is like, you dick luck. Why would you say something like that? You're going to get me killed. And also you, I guess. Uh, luck manages to actually counter uh, one of Beast Magic Guy's attacks and land a blow on him. Uh, and uh, But he doesn't do really any damage. So the Beast Magic Guy uh, says, oh, you know, good job managing to match my pace. You've got some pretty good speed. But uh, still, Luck didn't manage to do anything to him. And at that moment, we get a flashback from Magna's perspective from when they first met uh, in the Black Bulls. And Luck doesn't appear to have changed remotely. <laughs> His hair got all. longer. Or shorter. Uh, he grew up a little bit. His neck seems longer in current day. Uh, but Magna was going for his weird hairstyle, but it was only, like, just starting off. Honestly, I think it looks better in the flashback than it does now, because <laughs> it's not quite as goofy. <laughs> um, but, uh, Luck did a Joy Buzzer gag with him. Like, they shook hands, and then he immediately just, just shocked him with his electric magic. Like, eh. And apparently Magna had, uh, they had a little bit of difficulty getting along because, just because Luck was kind of doing his own thing. Uh, but Magna admits to himself, but out of all of them, you know, you were the one that I, uh, I guess, wanted to match up with. Yeah, he's, um, you know, even though you were tough and annoying, I respected you. And I always wanted to be as good as you were, essentially. And uh, so then we get the same flashback from Luck's perspective, uh, which is that uh, from the first time that he saw him, you know, he didn't think very much of him. But my instincts warned me, this guy's going to be interesting. Parentheses dangerous. Uh, so he kept on, he, he basically deliberately messed with Magna so that Magna would be pushed in order to be an interesting opponent for him. Uh, and as a result of that, they Magna was his first friend in the Black Bulls because of that weird relationship that they had. Um, and so that relationship pushes them to kind of push each other in this battle with the Beast Magic guy. Um, but then we cut away. Because to uh, Asta and Kiato, uh Kianto explains his dance magic for a bit, and he says, yes, I put myself in a trance, and when I'm like that, my opponent can't predict my moves, and Asta goes, and Kianto says, what the fuck are you doing? And Asta says, I'm going into a trance. And Kianto doesn't respond to this, because that's the best way to deal with Asta's <laughs> stupidity. Um, he detects Ask, uh, not ask, uh, he detects Luck and Magna's magics uh, and Ask is like, okay well, that's Magna and Luck well, those two are crazy, but when it comes right down to it they're super reliable, they won't die, cut to their corpses now uh, they are, however, in bad shape, lying on the ground with Beast Magic Guy, just looming over them, he's conjured these giant claws of magic and he says, ah, you see, the weak get eaten, and despair, it's all that's left to them. But Luck and Magna stand up again, bleeding all over, and... <sighs> <laughs> they say, well, if we ever despaired, then we would be too embarrassed to ever like to like Asta's superiors again. You see... When Poochie's not on screen, <laughs> everyone should be asking, where's Poochie? Shouldn't they be thinking of Yami at a time like this? <laughs> and how he'll kill them if they don't live up to his expectations? Like, he was the last guy that, you know, they heard from. They haven't been thinking about Asta this entire time. They've been thinking about each other. And now they're like, but Asta's the most important. Anyway, Not much um, they charge ahead uh, and combine magics 
uh, simultaneously together. And there's a huge distar discharge of power as they both connect with Beast Magic Guy. And on the next page, he's blocked it. That's it. Yeah, uh, he and made, they both... He made a... <laughs> big, like, Beast Fists. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, Annalisa's explanation. Honestly, I let her each chapter of this series while thinking of how Nick will respond to this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yeah, he's made two giant fists in order to block their attacks. Uh, and Beast Magic Guy says, You are just magics. Even when given a chance, that's the best you can do. Take this, the despair called death. Uh, but Asta jumps in and is like, now the important character is here, and so I will fight you. Um, he blocks the attack, and um, it's his anti-magic sword, so he just, you know, shrugs it off, and Beast Magic Guy says, this is a good opportunity. I'll give you several times the pain you gave Leashed just like these maggots at my feet. And as it says, they're not maggots, they're part of my team. And as they're junior, I'll pick up their duty and take you down! And he draws his other sword and slashes it in the same motion. So, I liked what this chapter started to do a lot, actually. I, I like, you know, I, I like the kind of duality of Magna and Luck both kind of thinking back to the same memories and, you know, independently thinking about how one another inspires him to move forward. It's very a very shown-in rival relationship that we, you know, discover Zorro. they have. Zoro and, and Sanji, kind of. Yeah, and it makes sense because, you know, these are two young male characters who both have, you know, similar kind of magic styles, both very, like, battle, you know, kind of... Obviously, battle-focused magics, lightning magic and fire magic. Like you can't get any more like shonen battle obvious than that. So it's two characters who we've also seen a bit about and seen their relationship. It does kind of make sense why one another finds the other inspiring. You know, Magna's like, "I'm intimidated by you, but I won't let you get ahead of me. I'm always going to jump up to you." And you know, Luck saying like, "Ooh, you seem dangerous, so I want to I want to bring that out of you, and I need to." keep you know making sure i'm always a step ahead so the way that they push each other i think was very cool and i i liked it as just a little bit of a touch to further develop the black bulls um the only thing that's obviously unnecessary is the fact that in this moment where they both feel despair or it looks like things are have got rough on them that they think to asta and it's how they feel that they they disappoint asta is why they get up and, and make another attack it's Look, I, I don't want to harp on, like, the ass to think. Honestly, it, it only bothers me because it just doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no reason for them to think yeah. of an ass in this. Like, if, 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 as you said, Yami, even if they had to go with someone else, would make more sense. You know, they don't want to disappoint their captain who they know is watching this. But I think it would have made more sense if, when they got up, they both, like, I don't want to disappoint him. He's referring right to each here. other. Right. Uh, the, the, it started off with them thinking about their relationship with each other, and that gave the, that helped give them the motivation to keep fighting. And then when they were pushed to their limit, it's like, Asta, yes, it, it's Asta. The issue with it is that it it's really negates the what building they just of the did. relationship at the beginning of the chapter. Yeah, and it's it's also something that kind of like look, I he's not Christ. He's not. I don't say I'm not saying like Asta's too perfect. I'm not trying to go on that or anything like that. I just saying it makes the world feel small when every character's motivation seems to be their relationship with Asta, who's someone they honestly haven't known for that long. Like, it actually would have felt a little bit more impactful if you know they had kept it to being Magna and Luck inspire each other. I I know Asta is important to them, so I don't mind that he comes in at the end of the scene. I mean, fuck, who else was gonna actually legitimately fight this guy if Yami couldn't get involved? Like, I'm not you know crazy enough for that. It just felt like an odd decision to put that in there when so much of the rest of the chapter was devoted to bringing these two and building their rivalry with one another. Hmm. <sighs> well, it's okay, Chris, because next chapter, Asta will go, you use beast magic, huh? And then he'll go, rawr! Now I can use beast magic, and I'm, everything will be okay. I'm going to tell you what's going to actually happen next chapter, Nick. 
he's going to go into an actual trance so that he's able to then make his moves unpredictable and uncounterable, and that's how he's going to beat the Beast Magic guy. You're probably right. Uh, I'm actually well, so confident, I feel like I'd put money on it. <laughs> at least Rebecca's not going to be there. Well, yeah, well, that's just not an important character. She's not going to come back. I think we missed our quota last week, so... I don't. I try not to put it in every week, Nick. Only when it's relevant. Well, I'm, in, I'm pretty sure I didn't do my Unahana last week, so... Uh... Yeah. Speaking of which, it's time for Bleach! 676 Horn of... Salvation. Sorry, the, the, the title got randomly shoved over into his cloak. It's like someone was typing in, Horn of... Uh, Oops, tap. I didn't mean to put that. Eh, fuck it. Backspace is so far away. <laughs> Print. Salvation. Horn of like, Salvation. Why is that large space there? There's nothing in the middle. You know what's great about Yuhabak's uh, new palace, Chris? Yes. Is that it's just similar enough to Las Noches that Kubo doesn't have to do backgrounds. He's like, everything behind them is white! So, yeah. Uh, this chapter opens, you know, Ichigo, of course, did his stupid-looking new transformation uh, last week, and Rihime is reacting to it because she recognizes, oh, you know, there's... He looks really similar in a lot of ways to that you know, horrible, monstrous hollow form he had before. So she's worried if he's going to be in control or not. And so he turns around and he's like, it's okay, in a way, you know. Yeah, what up, Bay? It's... I like it. Is he smiling that form just like... I makes like... it even worse. It looks dorky. It doesn't look good. But I like that Ichigo, for once, actually seems like he's having fun in a fight. Like, he... Act... Normally his fight's always so dour and just like, I can't lose control, I have to fight you! And I know this is the big fight of the series, but it's just nice to see Ichigo in a fight smiling and in control. Like, so much of the series has been like, this isn't even my power that's beating you! Oh, the angst! And it's, I don't know, I just found it refreshing for once, even if he looks like a really I do appreciate the note demon. of... I do appreciate the note of Ichigo stopping to reassure Urihime because Ichigo is supposed to be all about, you know, defending his friends and so on and so forth. I fight for my friends kind of thing. And a lot of the times his fights do not seem to remember that. He just, you know, kind of charged in with his sword like he did with Yabak. And like you said, a lot of angst-driven stuff. So him stopping, oh, like, okay, Arihime is here. The last time that I did this, I wasn't myself. So, you know, everything's okay. Uh, and he explains to Yuhabak that, you know, this is, you know, the combination of, you know, the Quincy power I inherited from my mother, manifested by old man Zangetsu, and the hollow inside me mixed with the Soul Reaper power I got from my dad. While they maintained equilibrium by opposing each other, they were forged together as Zangetsu into these two swords. If that equilibrium made him behave himself, then tipping the balance should bring him out. And in the past, when I was struck by huge amounts of Soul Reaper hollow powers, he took over. Is that really what happened? I always thought it was just you got really mad. <laughs> Whatever. It's uh, yeah, I have no clue what the half of this shit means. Yeah. So um, he explains that you know, in order to pull this out, basically, I you know use some your Quincy power because I'm not quite adept at combining their power together. So he kind of. He used hacks. He he, ch he cheated a little bit. He he stole from Yuhabak's pile so that he could have his own. Yeah. Uh, and then he moves around the uh, the Urihime's barrier, and Urihime is like, "When did he get in front of it? Oh, Ichigo move fast. Call the presses. He never moves fast. It's not like he's got like two different techniques before this one that let him move fast." Come on. <laughs> anyway. Um, Ichigo warns Orihime to get back, and then he starts releasing his power, and there's huge blast of energy, and so Yubak says, Oh, it's such magnificent power. And he draws his sword as well. Ichigo dashes in really, really quickly and stops him from completely pulling his sword out and then slashes his sword as well. But 
and the swing of his sword causes the building behind them to start to collapse, but Yuhabak has caught the blade, which means it should probably not have actually... whatever. Anyway, uh, but Yuhabak's like, oh, did you really think you could take me down with this? And um, I guess he throws Ichigo away. I can't tell because Bleach never uses big panels where it should. Um, but Ichigo starts to prepare what looks like Getsuga Ten Show. But uh, Yuhabak you mocks him saying, it's the same thing. I won't. And then he's like, no, wait a minute. That's not it. Uh, and he realizes that Ichigo is actually combining Getsuka Ten Show with a Grand Ray Cero. And Ichigo swings his sword, and it seems it looks like Yuhabak's been bisected, but probably not. Um, See, I, I when I don't understand half of Bleach's terms anymore, and I've been playing a lot of Overwatch. So when this final like attack happened, I just imagined Ichigo essentially is like screaming out like the Hanzo ultimate sound. Like, he's like, "We go! I got took a boss!" Like, all right, some big dragon attack energy thing comes out and does that because. Uh. I don't understand what this energy thing means more than another one. This is the one the hollows use, right? Saros are uh, the regular energy attack that hollows spit out. Uh, a Grand Ray Sarah was demonstrated by some of the Espada. Basically, it's a really big Saro. Okay. That's about it. Um, so, parts of this chapter I honestly do like. Um, it's nice to finally see Ichigo just fucking using powers and fighting uh, as opposed to and now he'll fight these four women that beat up Zaraki well enough of that he's gotta go back up the way he came <laughs> um, and of course you know you gotta have moments like this where it seems like the good guy has gotten one up on the bad guy by you know using some new unexpected technique but most likely Geobuck's going to be fine because he hasn't used the true power of the almighty yet um, my main problem is still is just Ichigo still looks stupid <laughs> he starts to look a bit better when in that very final panel where it looks like he's getting more hollow energy and there's more darkness surging around him but when it's just like, I'm Ichigo, and I've got a little bit of face paint on, and there's this one doofy horn sticking out. It's like, no, no. You, no. Uh, but that's it. That's the end of the chapter. Do you want me to uh, do the recap for Boruto, then? Oh, yeah. That one. <laughs> you know, I was going to get water while, you, while we discussed Fairy Tale, but oh. I have less to say about Boruto, so I'll be right back. <laughs> so... This is Boruto, Naruto, the Next Generation, Chapter 2, The Training Begins. And uh, I'm going to kind of breeze through this one a little bit. Uh, essentially, last time, uh, Naruto, or sorry, Boruto, was like, Sasuke, train me, because you're super cool, and my dad sucks. And so Sasuke starts this one by being like, can you do the Rasengan? And Boruto's like, no, but, 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 but uh, give me a day and I'll do it. And he runs off. Uh, we get a flashback, which is, like, oddly, like, six straight pages of no dialogue, just pure action. It was kind of interesting. Um, it also helped to make it a lot easier to kind of get through this chapter. Uh, essentially, it just shows that Sasuke was fighting a couple people, and he's like, oh, you're from the same clan as Kaguya, which is something I think we pretty much already knew about. Uh, cut away, Boruto asks Konohamaru to help teach him the Rasengan, and we get a little bit of a, a small training arc where Boruto's kind of like, no, I want to be better! You Show me it right away! He's like, no, it takes time and patience. He's like, oh! So he manages to make just a very tiny Rasengan. But he manages to do that in a day. And everyone's like, that's super impressive. Except Boruto, who's like, no, it needs to be bigger than that, or Sasuke will never train me. And well, he like literally... Sasuke, makes, Sasuke he, makes this kind of offhand remark about how small it is. Yeah, he says to him, like, oh, it's kind of small. And Boruto throws it in anger, then runs away. And Sonata comes down, she's like, well, you shouldn't have said that to him. I mean, it's pretty tough he made it even that far. You know, and Sasuke's like, neither of you have let me finish. I was going to say he could become my student. Like, 
That's still impressive. Boruto's just a shit who ran away before I could finish my sentence. I, li I like Sarada's, like, appearances in this chapter because... <sighs> It seems as though, because she's really excited, and it seems as though it's like, oh, you know, her teammate is finally getting serious about training, so she's really excited about it. You know, she wants to have, like, actual competition from, I guess, her friend over this. And, you know, at the end also, when they're accepted, they're applying for the exam, she's excited that she, that he's going to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, well, you know, I've grown to like Serata, and so seeing her, you know, not being a depressed little Uchiha <laughs> it makes me happy. It is nice. Uh, Boruto then goes into the scientist area and uh, finds, like, a douchey scientist who essentially gives him, like, a cheating device to make a bigger Rotsen gun. And Boruto takes that so he can be like, sweet, now I can make a super Rotsen gun and I'll super impress Sasuke. And mm -hmm. Sasuke is like, that is impressive. Um, you're quite different from your father, though. Yeah, well, there's a great there's a great moment because he notices the device in hidden un, in Boruto's sleeve. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say anything about that much. He's like, "Oh, you advanced that much." Uh, and Bo, Bo, Boruto says, "I'm not like my dad when it comes to talent." Yes, and Sasuke just says, "Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're very you different. Really different from Naruto." And I really like that moment. Because he's, you can tell how disappointed he yeah. really is. So I'd hope you know. that wasn't the case. Yeah. He's like, what? Because like, Bolt's a little shit. <laughs> yeah, he's like, fine, you can be my student. And he starts telling him, you know, like, they're, they're, they're I guess, hanging out, eating food, and Boruto asks him, like, hey, what was my dad like? And Sasuke kind of, again, it's kind of a nice moment where Sasuke kind of explains to him what Naruto is like, but he explains to him more about his dad when he was younger and talk about how he was annoying he was a bumbling fool he was all these things but you know you shouldn't be studying who your dad is today you should want to know who he was in the past don't care about your dad the hokage what's important about him and what you should really be learning from him is who he was when he was your age kind of thing and i, I like that moment it's sasuke trying to impart a smart lesson but Boruto's just like, oh, could you tell me my dad's weakness? Is it water? Can I throw water at him? <laughs> can I just spray it in a little bottle like I would at a cat? Uh, then uh, basically just get a couple kind of shots around of the team, new Team 7, like showing off their tuning exam entrance form. They're all going to be competing together and blah, 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 blah. Then we get our villain group and they killed fucking Killer B. The end. <laughs> I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's going to be fully dead, and I guess this is something I guess the, the movie already covered, but it just annoyed me that it's, like, offhand in the last two pages, like, of the fucking chapter, not given much attention of Killer B's, like, body dropping to the ground. I was like, what the fuck? Uh, there are honestly parts of this chapter that I, do, that I did really like. It is just hard to get behind so much of it because, like, God, Bolt! You little asshole! I, it's, God damn it, you piece of shit! <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, Boruto, if nothing else, is making me appreciate Asta more and more as a protagonist, because at least every time Asta does something annoying, I can be like, at least he's not fucking Boruto. Holy shit. Ugh, alright. So, let's move on to Fairy Tale then. Fairy Tale Chapter 488, The Two of Us, Always. So last time, Gajio had defeated Bradman and his anti-magic particles, uh, but Bradman in the last moment was like, you're coming with me, and tries to drag him into, I guess, sort of like an explosion, like kind of the, or implosion, I don't know, a big portal of anti-magic particles of death. He goes full Andros on yeah. him. He's if like, I go down, I'm taking you with me! Exactly. So, uh, Gajio's like, no, I can't get out of this. And they're like, oh, this is a portal to the afterlife. From here, there is no return. So, Revy uh, is like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to save you. And Gajio's like, no, don't. Uh, you know, if you touch me, my entire body's made of anti magic particles, you'll die. And he's like, I don't it's care. It's like the vortex, too, probably. Yeah. And she's like, I don't care. I came to save you, and I will. And Gajio, like, literally like, throws shackles to kind of like stick her to a wall so she can't move forward and it's a cool moment where she's like 
you're not dealing with the same levy as before. And she starts writing her magic script with her leg and creates like a sword that she uses just cut through the rock. And that's how she escapes it. Cool little moment. And I like it because immediately as soon as that, Kajio reacts and Lily Panther comes out of behind her and just bear hugs her and just holds her as she's screaming like, no, let me go. I had to save him. And Lily Panther's like, I'm so sorry about this, but I, you know, I can't, you'll get sucked in too. So Kajio's, you know, being sucked into the portal at the very end here. And he's like, Levy, I really used to be the worst kind of trash. And then I met you. And because of you, I might be a better man, at least a little because you taught me how to love another person. And uh, you made me start thinking about all the other kinds of stuff I thought of in my, you know, I never thought of in my life, like the future, family, happiness. He imagines oh. they're kids? <laughs> and a tiny, I guess that's just regular Lily Panther just shrunk down. And he's like, ain't that a laugh? Me, wanting to be like everybody else. I wanted the two of us to walk together, always. And, uh, says, I'm leaving my future to you, Lily Panther. Make sure she gets back to the guild. And, you know, Lily Panther's last words, I'm like, oh, she'll get there. And he disappears into the portal. Levy screams out Gajil's name. And we cut away to Actologia. Who... Now, if this had been the entire chapter, it would have been like, well, that sucks. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that he's okay because it's fairy tale, but pretty effective sequence. And you bought into it because of how effective the previous chapter was. And also just being invested in their relationship. And this little bit here is also fine. Yeah, it's I, at the end where I just go, God damn it! Well, because we, we cut over to Actologia, who's like, six left. Until every dragon's been slain. So he sensed that Gajil is presumably dead. Uh, at which point, Arena shows up and she's like, Oh, you are quite powerful. And he's like, if you know that, why are you here? She's like, oh, I know, but uh, I think I will be a challenge to you. And we cut away again, this time back to the conversation between August and Brandish. And By the way, they never bothered to shrink Happy back down, so he's just looming over us. He's just an enormous tower of fucking cat. Uh, they, they continue their kind of argument. You know, last time, August was just like, I follow my majesty's orders. The fact that you're even questioning this shows that you've betrayed us. And, you know, Brandon just, like, explained, like, look, you, you understand. This is just a war of, like, ideologies. You know what's going to happen. This is just going to be Xerif eliminating everybody. And what's what's the point of that? You know, August has a pretty good response. He's like, I will leave the aftermath to my majesty. You know, I'm not, I'm not fucking here to argue with it. I follow his orders. Um, Brandon's like, no, I don't think these people are evil. August, at least try talking to them. And... August stops and he's like, well, okay, because it's you, I'll give it a shot. At which point, uh, Brandish is just like, thanks, Grandpa August. I'm taking out a knife and stabbing you because there's one person I've always wanted to kill. And everyone's like, what happened? And then we cut over it's and actually, It's actually a really brutal thing because she doesn't just stab him with a knife. She, she throws him. the knife as she's stabbing him with it. Yeah. Really cool use of her powers. And we cut um, over to Mest who's like, <laughs> And Natsu says what I'm thinking, which is, What the hell are you doing? He's like, I planted a memory in her that August was someone that she had to kill. Why? And to protect the guild. He goes, I did it for the guild. <laughs> and everyone's like, What, what the, the fuck, fuck you dumb piece of sh Why are you a thing? Why are you still a thing? And so August goes, well, clearly these people are fucking evil. And he's just glowing with black magic. And Brian's like, what the hell did I just do? And the yeah, chapter ends with, well, now the fucking most powerful wizard aside from Zeref in the world is going to kill them all. <laughs> it's just like, Mest, what were you doing? You're she so... talked him down. You're the worst thing. You're the worst part of fairy tale. Why? What are you? Everything going. you've done, everything that's happened about you is dumb as shit. <laughs> Master Spark K in the chat. You messed up. Yeah, that about sums it up. He fucking did. What is he doing? It's uh. like, okay. I know it's because you had to have them fight August and actually fight him. But what the fuck, man? 
<laughs> Such a shitty reason for it, too. It's not even like he was suggestively saying a threat, and that's when he did it. He's like, he dropped his guard down slightly. Time to kill the most powerful wizard known to man! It's like, With a knife not... to the chest! That'll do it! And not even in terms of this was not a very well thought out plan. Because, by the way, it wasn't. <laughs> I'll just have someone he trusts stab him all of a sudden. <laughs> Clearly, this will definitely work on the person whose scope of power I have no idea of. I can't even like, comprehend how fucking absurdly powerful this thing is. But also, you're supposed to be one of the good guys! <laughs> it's a very evil moment from him. Like, even his face is clearly sinister. But, like, he gives this reasoning that's supposed to be like, But it's for the guild! I did it for the guild. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, God. Oh. I think that we have... I'm pretty sure that we have one of our, like, you know, yearly rewards for, like, worst plan or something like that. Something like that. Mess is gonna make a list somehow in terms of worst moments in the account. <laughs> this was terrible. I'll put, I'll put an idea on here. Worst idea of the year. <laughs> oh, messed. Uh, no other nominees will be accepted. <laughs> Let's move over to Food Wars. Chapter 169, rematch. Last time after Arina spilled her guts to Soma, Soma offered to cook Yukihira style uh, for her again. But we begin with a flashback to uh, Senzaemon and Joichiro Saiba meeting up, uh, I believe, before the end... Of yes, before the beginning of the school year, actually. Um, oh, no, wait. Oh, no. Huh. I can't... I'm not really sure when that happened. Oh, oh, okay. It was it's before, before someone went into school. That was why. That was, that was what it happened. Okay. Um, so, uh, it was a little bit into the school year, but still quite a ways ago. So, uh, they talk for a little bit about things that are going on. And, uh, Joey Trubill brings up, you know, I didn't really want someone to come here, you know, but you kept on bothering me about it. Um, and, uh, then he actually, they actually get to the point of his visit, which is he's learned that a zombie is up to something. And he just says, the source is reliable, I trust it. He doesn't say what the source was, which might end up playing an important thing later. I don't know. Um, but Sentamon expresses really deep concern for Arena because of, you know, fear of him is still deeply, deeply rooted in her heart. And I expect he will take full advantage of that to once again make her his. Um, and uh, so he's trying to think about what they should do in order to counteract this. But Joey Drew just says, whatever we adults do, it won't be enough to fix the problem, not at its root. I'm thinking the only ones who can truly save your granddaughter will be those she lived and competed with this entire time, her friends and classmates in Soma's class. And uh, then we cut to uh, the present, where Soma is getting ready. Hisako is still panicking, which amuses me deeply for some reason. She's going around like, where is she? <laughs> um, and uh, she's bringing this up to people, and she's like, I don't know where she is! Maybe she's been kidnapped by a zombie who's being carted away as we speak! And then Megumi is just like, well, it sounds like she's in someone's room. What?! <laughs> uh, I forgot that they had established this a long-ass time ago, but they have those old-school uh, speaking valves that they have in some really old buildings. I don't know what the exact name for them is, but it's the kind of pipe that you... Old-timey speaky brassy things! Old-timey speaky brassy tube things. Um, and so they all... Pretty much all of the girls in the freaking dorm just crowd around this thing to overhear what's going on as Soma gets ready. Um, and Arian is expressing doubts over Soma's ability to actually do this. Um, but... And she says, I mean, you don't even know his recipes. And Soma's like... Nope! <laughs> um, but uh, he says, like, yeah, it's okay, though. I, I know all of its techniques, uh, so this will be a genuine you can hear a dish. Uh, I'll serve up one of my specialties, and all the girls who are listening in are like, oh, no, he's going to use one of his gross experiments, serve one of his gross experiments to her. 
And a bunch of them have, you know, like, oh no, she's not going to be able to take it because of her incredibly refined palate. It uh, might kill her. It, <laughs> literally. <laughs> it may just taste so horrible it kills her. <laughs> um, and more people are starting to crowd around the valve, too, talking about uh, tempura, the tempura rice bowl that he's going to make. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to make a tempura rice bowl. And everyone's like, oh, that sounds kind of normal. And then Bun Girl's like, but he didn't say what kind. Who knows what it could be? And there's just a shot of a bowl with the contents, like, mosaic out. Like, it's shit, or, like, something perverted you can't see. <laughs> like, it's a crime scene, like, we blurred out this for the so safety horrible. of young viewers. It's such a horrible graphic scene that we had to center out the dish. But Megami actually says, it'll be okay. I'm sure there's something someone's trying to get across to Nakiri, and he's going to do that through his cooking. Everything will be fine. I just know it. And everyone's like, oh, Megami. But it's not really reassuring to hear that for the person that has had to taste the most of his dishes. Who's been fooled by his cooking so much. <laughs> just like suffer freaking, freaking uh, uh, Stockholm Syndrome for <laughs> tasting his cooking. I do like their noting of that detail. I completely forgot yeah. that she tends to be his guinea pig. I, I thought it was very funny. Um, but uh, we get a little bit of a montage of, uh, you know, some of preparing different uh, items for the dish. Uh, and Arian is watching him, and she thinks to herself, you know, you had the same look on your face that day, too. The day you challenged Eishi Tsukasa. Despite the enormity of the barrier you were attempting to hurdle, the look on your face was as if cooking was so much fun, you could hardly contain yourself. And when I was still a child, I felt the same. But she just has this long flashback explanation of, She's had perfection drilled into her so so much that deep down inside, I don't think cooking is very fun at all. Uh, and yeah, even I, I love this flashback too. I like the way it starts, like a shot of her and Alice's kids, like smiling as they look over some food. With their little, with their little pigtails because yeah, their yeah, hair the, tied up and their little and aprons and shit gathered around a cooking pot and they look so happy together and... then it hard cuts to the most like unintimate setting of just food long stretched across the table with her sullenly looking over with like darkness like raining down behind her and all these shadowy adults who are just like you have to do this it's the name you you've been born with such a gift so you must try all of this food oh you're so much better than everyone else and you know hard cut back to alice being super excited and her just like I don't even fucking know anymore. Yeah, you know, Alice saying like, you know, we're gonna get to Totsuki, and I love cooking so much. So you know, getting to you know get better at is gonna be so much fun. But we're gonna be rivals when we get there. So I'm not gonna go easy on you. So you have to, we have to both give it our best. And he's like, yeah, okay, right. Um, and then we cut all the way back to the present because the sad memories are making her expression fall. So someone says. Hey, what's with that face, Nakiri? You know, for you to act all bossy and stuck up, sometimes you get like that. And it's time for you to shape up. After all, right now, I finally got my chance at a rematch since that first time you tried my cooking, and that gets me has me more excited than you'd believe. And we go all the way back to like the second and third chapter when she rejected his cooking and said it was bad. And he says, "Today's the day I finally make you say loud and clear that you think my cooking is good." And he finishes up the dish and presents her a bowl with the rice tempura and he says all right it's done dig in um i do, I do like ending the chapter on that note of this is what soma's thinking you know he of course recognizes that Arina needs this this to not be you know all sad and depressed and stuff but in the end he's kind of a selfish person he's doing this for his own self-satisfaction uh, he's, this is his chance at revenge, and that's why the, what the chapter title comes from, is this is what he thinks of as his chance at revenge, really. Um, so yeah, a, a really nice chapter. Uh, I'm sure the next one is going to have a long explanation of the dish, so having a character focus in this one, I think, was really nice. It's a, it's a fine chapter. It's, you know, one of those ones. It has some really good character moments, and I like seeing the, the flashback with... Uh, I always forget his name, Joichiro. Joichiro, yeah. Um, it's nice seeing that because it adds a little bit more context into perhaps why Sanzeman, when things first got you know developed, 
he turned to Soma first instead mm-hmm. of like someone like Alice. Like this adds because, a little bit more context. Say, yeah, like that's why. he's, he's going to need that classmate. So it's nice to get that. Um, it's just a shame though because this, you know, spoilers. This is a week where not a lot happened in Jump. To be completely honest, and this was right. you know another chapter that ends with like next week things will be interesting. Like all right, you know, it, uh, this is a good chapter. It's just. I want, you know, I want the development, and that's that's what's going to come next week. Okay. Oh, we need to hurry up, Nick. You're not going to have yeah. the time to watch any NXT. Uh, My Hero Academy, yeah. I heard they just had the best match ever uh, with hmm, so versus mm, Alicia Fox. <laughs> I don't know. 93, Ember of One for All. Oh, this is a short chapter where nothing happens. Don't uh, really nothing focus happens on this. this one. Um, great awesome thing going on here honestly um we have a flashback uh, to begin things with um basically uh toshinori remembering nana and uh you know, her advice which was you know when you feel at your limb you're at your limit you just remember remember why you swing those fists i'm talking about where you started that's what you need to recall in order to push yourself that much further past your limit and toshinori recalls that when he was basically first starting off he said he wanted to make the world a place where everyone can live with a smile and for that the world needs a symbol uh so he just wanted to become that symbol and we cut to the present where he's still got that one bulked up arm and the rest of his body is frail and weak um and so he but he's still staying there still fighting and gran torino is basically beaten and broken and can only watch and he's thinking oh he He's had to counter so many massive attacks. He's gone so far past his limit. His body is unstable. He can only keep his right arm arm muscled up like this. Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, and all for one is completely confident. And he says, "Oh, well, this is gonna be your last punch, isn't it? Wounded heroes are always the scariest. After I ripped your guts out, the look on your face when you charged at me, I still see it in my dreams sometimes." Then again, you'll probably let loose a few desperate punches, so I should prepare myself. Um, but at that moment, suddenly Endeavor appears, shooting fire and shit. And Endeavor is uh, encouraging All Might from uh, far away. Uh, and there's honestly a really cool moment, a flashback from Endeavor's perspective, uh, where he thinks, you know, he went to... He knew that he could never actually reach All Might. They and that was why he had Todoroki. Like, he, he knows, so. like, all this, I did all this just to beat you, but the gap between us was so large, and that despair is what led me to when he just thinks Todoroki and his wife. Mm-hmm. He's like, explain to me why you're like this, because, you know, I didn't go through this for you to look so pathetic right now. Are you really the man I've been chasing all this time, basically? Yeah. Uh, and, uh the edge hero guy the one that can send out strands of his body and stuff also jumps in as well uh he interferes a little bit in the fight kami woods as well uh and they and kami woods manages to get basically all of the wounded heroes to safety um mount lady and uh best genist and uh orca gangster guy (laughs) (laughs) gotta save him uh it's kind of cool you'd see uh tiger there he's saving the woman who was trapped so he's like you know don't worry you don't have to protect her anymore we're here to ease your burden so Mm -hmm. do it because we're all rooting for you it's it's an awesome moment where all the heroes are kind of working together to motivate all my like do it because we we're going to support you be the hero that you're you're always going to be and uh then we get a flashback from gran torino's perspective of the conversation he had with nana which was like, oh, so you've chosen you know, that Torshinori guy in order to, to be your... Uh, what's the fucking term? Successor. That's yes. It. Um, and so now he explains, yeah, you know, he says the crime is not going to go down because the people don't have anyone to rely on. The country has no, no pillar to support it, and so he says he's going to be that pillar. Uh, and now he's basically being that pillar now everyone has pinned all of their hopes on him winning and we get this huge montage of all the people watching the fight unfold 
cheering screaming. on yeah yeah cheering on Toshinori who is still looking almost completely broken and all of a sudden <laughs> Alpha Alpha just goes what a pain spirit this hope that wake up this is reality spring like limbs kinetically boosted by four and the strength enhanced by three a multiplier hypertrophy rivets airwalk spear like bones the shockwaves up until now were just meant to wear you down not much oomph though in order to really kill you i'll be hitting you with my ultimate quirk combination here it comes it's terrifying <laughs> turns his arm into this monstrous thing yeah I'll like, it's one huge fist with like rocks and gems. And other it. arms. Four arms like, hang off it. It's like drills and stalag stalagmites and all this stuff. This horrifying thing. So All Might's got his one muscled arm, and All for One has got his one thinged arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he's thinking to himself as he charges in with his, you know, his quirk combination trading blows with you earlier was enough to finally confirm my suspicions you no longer possess one for all what you're using now is the after effects mere dregs the ember that remained after the transfer and that ember gets dimmer every time you draw on it a weak little flicker that doesn't even need blowing out it'll soon die on its own izuku midoriya he was the recipient right he came to you completely unqualified. He still can't even control it, can he? You've got plenty to regret as you die, All Might, because you've also failed as a teacher. I love All For One. <laughs> Such an evil fucking monster. <laughs> it's got some great lines, though. Uh, and they clash fists. And suddenly, mentally, All For One... Uh, just mentally announces impact recoil all your power is going to come crashing back on you basically he saved up this one quirk in order to just blast it back with all of his all of his remaining strength as he's releasing it uh but toshinori says you know you're right as a teacher i have definitely fallen short and i'm willing to accept that one thing to just note he destroyed toshinori's arm he literally like eviscerated it to the elbow stump. He's he toricoed him. <laughs> yeah, he just uh, blew it up essentially. Uh, and all for one is thinking to himself as you know Alma is continuing to fight back. Uh, so pathetic. Your dying ember will go out all on its own, but still you struggle. Until your job on this earth is done, you'll keep it alive, struggling desperately to keep it going. And there's this mental image of a naked shriveled up Toshinori just desperately hunched around the ember of, of one for all trying to keep it alive in the middle of a blizzard uh, but Toshinori of course remembers Nana's words uh, about you know when you're at home to remember this and so Toshinori thinks I'm more than just the symbol just as my master was there for me I've got to raise him right so until then and everyone, all for one suddenly goes oh so you would stoop this low and struggle so unseemly. I miscalculated. As Toshinori's muscled up arm switches to his other arm. Yeah. And he fucking left hooks all, all for one right across the jaw. And a great he... fucking shot. You can see like the sweeping arc of it coming from the bottom of the page. and just like knocks fucking all for one's face uh, across. And he just declares, you know, until I raise him right, I can't die. A uh, really cool chapter uh, builds up to a really awesome climactic moment of this one huge punch, uh, and I'm excited to see where this goes next. It's fantastic. This is a, an amazing chapter. Um, it really, you know, it's it's a moment that seemed like something bad's gonna happen to All Might, and it looked like uh, how absurdly powerful all for one was so it seemed like this was going to be just like the villains fucking absolute victory but i love this moment where you know no matter what you know all might saying like i can't die because i need to be a mentor for uh deku and i thought that was a, such an awesome moment and that's my work isn't my work isn't done yet yeah so. 
It's gonna be sad if he fucking dies at this point. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna do a full recap of Nisekoi, um, <clears throat> because we're gonna probably go long as it is. Uh, but basically, the important stuff that happens is that Onidera, uh, and, and I think she gave their memories get jogged, and so they actually remember when they were kids. Um, and it seems as though the promise that was made was Chijuge promising to marry Raku. Uh, it was a very childlike thing, though, because they based it off the storybook that they had, and mostly it was just, they all knew each other as kids, and they were such great friends that they wanted to promise to see each other again. Well, the promise was fulfilled, so that's the most important thing. And then Chijuge kind of filled in, you know, threw in, and I'm going to marry him. And I do like the final page, because it's all of the, you know, for the other three girls reacting to her decoration, and Yui and Onodera are like, huh, and Marcus was like, no, he's mine! <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's really all I have to say about it. Um, One Piece! Uh, honestly, uh, you know, because we're running a little bit long, I think we can kind of... No, hold on. Alright, no, I remember this. The thing that's stupid about this Ch Nisekoi chapter is she doesn't say we'll get married. She says, and then we'll all get married. As in, all of us. All four girls will get married. I'm telling you, it's leading up to a non-conclusion. They're going to find out both of their keys fucking open it, or none of the keys open it, and the real fucking message was the adventure, the real love they share was the adventures they shared it together. The, it wasn't about the destination, it was about the journey. The, the real key is the love they grew for all of each other as friends as time. I think there'll be a conclusion, but oh, I think the key lock it thing. Married. God damn it. Yeah, I think I think the, the lock and key thing is going to be bullshit. I'm, I'm, I'm really feeling strongly about that. As for One Piece... There really isn't that much to say about One Piece this week, so I think for the sake of time, we can kind of cut through a lot of this. Basically, okay. we're just getting some more explanation. We see who Pudding is as a person a little bit. There's some humor. Mm -hmm. There's some fun with it. Um, she there's explains... A, a cool little note because, apparently, because she and Sanji have actually seen yeah. each other. They've met each other. They like each other. And she just notes, like, Sanji really liked me, but he notes... I need to go back to my crew. I can't marry you. And she which, kinda... has, which leads to a great joke because all you know, all the straws there are like, Sandy turned down a girl. <laughs> there's a lot of very good humor too. I also like there's a moment where uh, they're like, we can't trust her. She's you know works for Big Mom. It's like, no, I think we can. And there's just a shot of Pedro like with a sword already at her throat. Like, what do you want me to do with her, Luffy? <laughs> um, I'm really liking Pedro. Honestly. Yeah, the small bits are very funny. Uh, uh, basically, Pudding gives them like a guide to follow on how to get to Whole Cake Island secretly, and they kind of head off on that. They find a, a note that seems Peckham saying, like, turn back. And then we cut away to an island that's been at war for two years that the Germa 66 just entered in and ended immediately. And we see Sanji's two older brothers, I believe. Mm -hmm. oh, um, they're one and two, and yeah. he was probably be three. They also note how many kids Big Mom actually has. It's something like 80 or something, something yeah. like that with a bunch of different fathers. It's um, massive. Um, and One Piece is going to be off next week, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a bummer because this isn't a great chapter to leave off on. Like, I'm not like, holy shit, what happens next? I'm like, no, let's do, do well, something yeah. more. We, the, the, Vin Smoke, the feared Vin Smoke family is very strong. I get it. <laughs> they all look like Sanji. I thought, <laughs> didn't we meet some of them before? But I suppose these are the big two of the family, so they're the most significant ones. And they all have, like, fucking uh, Cyborg 009 haircuts and shit like that to fit in with it. It's a good chapter. It's fun. I can't help but get the impression Pudding's not as nice as she seems. I think there's a, a heel turn coming up for her in the future. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we will... She's gonna, she's gonna throw Sanji through the barbershop window! <laughs> yeah, she's gonna fucking 3D him through a table when he's not looking. That bitch. Um, but... It's, it's, you know, a fine chapter, I suppose. Uh, Toriko. It's the only time I think we've ever spent through One Piece to get to Toriko. I don't even know if I really have much to say about Toriko. Toriko, honestly. turns There's out... There's a whole lot of details that I do skip through, honestly. Toriko, turns out all the islands are secretly named for Pangea because they were all one giant continent. The Dragon King is flying now, which I guess was one of the kings, but I didn't remember it. Um, a bunch of people are about to have a fight. The the other third member of the Toriko or uh, not, uh, Komatsu Chef Trio also has food luck, which I think we already kind of knew. Zara, uh, not Zero. What's the fucking big chef's name? Something with a Z. 
the big tall old ass chef who was the number one. I forget his name. Oh yeah. He's but he's about to fight uh dude with a beer General Uman, I who was another member of the betraying group. Seos, that's the name. Um uh... Toriko fights off the despair he feels from being confronted by Neo Acacia by saying, like, Neo's gonna be my meat dish now. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just like, eat me? I'll eat you! <laughs> and he does. He fucking digs a fucking chunk out of it. And I like, uh, his first demon is like, whoa, what are you doing? And the other demon's like, I fucking ate him! <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's about it. Yes. World Trigger, Chapter 146, Tamakoma 2, Part 14. Uh, it's a recap of their battle. Um, Literally. And... There is nothing else to this except explaining everything that just happened like in the past month. Well, it's, it's, a, it's you know, a, a kind of typical, you know, now let's take a moment to analyze what's happened thing that they tend to do a lot uh, in the Border Wars. There are little moments here and there that I do like. Oh, I love it. Uh, I love it. I'm just saying, I'm like, nothing happens beyond them explaining what happened the past month and I, for some reason, I'm still enraptured. Uh-oh. Tomokoma okay. is congratulating each other and uh, Yu is like, alright, yeah, we won. And he high-fives Osamu, yay! And he double high-fives Chika, yay! And then Yu Usami just like put arms around each other. <laughs> yay! Uh-oh, is this... is this Nick disconnecting? No, but we were so close, Nick! Your NXT is so close! You're almost there! Alright, well, while Skype tries to get him reconnected, uh, I'll just continue with this. Uh, essentially, they explain what efforts... Uh, the re-commentary team, I should say, are explaining exactly kind of what gave the, uh, the fight to Tamakoma, what tilted it in their favor. Um, they explain basically the the wire trick a little bit and how by doing so. Oh, are we back? Hello. There we go. No video. Um, can you see me? There we go. Oh, I can see right, you. Cool. I can't see me, but I just turn my. Ear. There we go. All right, we're good. Uh, I was going to point out that uh, they cut to Arashiyama squad outside because of the remnants of the whole minor invasion. And Hiroshima is like, hey, it looks like Mikuma's team won with seven points. And Nikita just goes, of course they did. <laughs> it's, just, uh, like, yeah. it's like, well, yeah, I knew they would, duh. I taught them to use the, I taught Osama with the spider. Of course they're going to win. <laughs> just like, not even like, oh, I am proud of my student. Or like, oh, I'm impressed. Just like, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> and I also love, you see me and Mia squads like, hmm. Well, because there's, they're probably gonna have to fight them again yeah because they fucking jump up they go from like i forget they were like eight or something like that and now they're, they're back, up back up to four. Up four yeah so uh most likely would have to go th they're going to meet up with the uh, team again soon um and once we we're through with like all the commentators talking about stuff uh we cut to uh kakizaki squad uh and he's you know apologizing to his team and uh, so he's like, I'm sorry, you know, we stuck to our formation way too long. This was my, this one's on me. And it seems we're like, well, you know, I don't know. Because, I mean, if we had split up and just charged in without knowing about the lead bullets, we would have probably been caught anyway. And uh, Teruya sa says, you know, that formation you have to stick to, that's our strength. So don't, you know, just say that you just abandon it. And the, they're... Th all, all of them just start, uh, you know, talking strategy while Kaki's just kind of looking on, and they're like, "Hey, come on, you're, you're our captain. You know, talk with us about this." It's, uh, it's one of those things where it's like it's a nice little bonding moment without having to have a big cry about stuff the way that Katori does later in the chapter. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. There is a conversation between Husei with Jin and, uh, fuck, I've forgotten the kid's name. It'll come to me later. Uh, and Husei is kind of analyzing, you know, Yotaro? The third. Yeah, Yotaro. Uh, he, he, Yotaro is like, so did you, did you get the trick that Osama used? And Husei says, well, this is only a guess, but it's probably actually the color of the wires. It's not just invisible and visible wires. There's probably a wide spectrum. Um, 
So if someone only sees like, oh, there's a red one and then there are normal invisible ones, then there are also ones that are barely visible that they're not going to be aware of. So it essentially you know, makes the decoy even more effective. So if you can detect it and relax, you know, but that puts you in a slow pace, which actually helps out Osamu anyway. So, um, and uh, so he sums it all up by just saying, when both sides are not much different in capability, whoever is more prepared wins. That's all there is to it. And that's what Osamu is good at, preparing. Mm. Uh, but they also, basically, everyone's like, oh, well, yeah, Tomokomo's, you know, you've shown off a lot of cool tricks. They jump all the way up to number four in the rankings. Um, and uh, that's it for all the matches. And then we cut to, Kiko- to, Kiko- to, eh, to Kiko- eh, Katori Squad's room, where Katori is just going, I want to quit Border. <laughs> Face down on the bed. Everyone's like, no, don't say that. We like you so much. <laughs> huh. For some reason, her sleeves change color from the first panel to the rest. Huh. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Fuck World Trick. I'm done with this series yeah, now. This is yeah, horse right. shit. This isn't the kind of consistency I'm going to tolerate from a series. She also has a leaf on her shirt. Hmm. Maybe that means she's going to fucking get a steering wheel through the chest like that asshole in Serenity. And I say asshole, I mean one of the main characters, but... <laughs> One of the one of the be- the most beloved characters from that. So yeah, just... whatever. As long as she's like, I'm like a leaf through the way. <laughs> uh, Katori's do throws a tantrum, and he told me says, "Look, if you want to quit, then go ahead and quit. You know, do what you want, because that's the type of person that you are." And when her black hair team is like, "But if we try harder, you know, if, if, but we can do better." And the, the reason you're mad, Samko, is that you're jealous of them. And we can be more if we're more creative like them, and we make a solid plan, and we can win. We're just as capable as they are. And Katori's like, "But I really suck at being at studying or being creative." And Hitomi says, "That's all right. As long as you feel the sting of defeat, then there's still room for you to become stronger." And I like how I it's, do really like that. I like how it's also not very indicative to the idea that she has grown from this. Like she still seems like kind of a twaddle. <laughs> like given the moment, like. We'll just have to study and get strong. She's like, but I'm bad at that! It's like, God! And he told me, just like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I was it. like, I'll take care of this, too. Well, I like how he told me he doesn't say, like, you know, it's okay, best friend, we'll stick through this, you know, to the end. She's just like, no, you know, you're not a lost cause. You can still get better, so you don't have to give up yet. I mean, you can if you want to, but it's not pointless to keep on going, so you might as well stick around. Yeah. Very, continuing the idea that she's, you know, very detached and objective about things. Um, and then we end uh, again with Jin and Husei and Yotaro, and Jin just says, you oh, know, Four Eyes is going to be a lot busier soon with you joining his squad, and that's going to be a whole lot of work for him, and that's it. Uh, it's not an incredibly eventual chapter, uh, like you yeah. said. Um, it's just kind of, but it's nice to have those moments of reflection occasionally for a series. Uh, so it was a pretty dull thing, but it's not like I disliked it. So yeah, it's a perfectly good chapter. Uh, I I mean I mentioned on Twitter I was like the fact that you know World Trigger is able to make a situation like this entertaining is credit to the series because this is literally just a recap of everything that's happened so uh you know fun chapter it's just not a very significant one mm-hmm. let's well, wrap this up nick's got things to do let's uh yeah favorite chapters and mvps um well my hero academy ran away with the uh, uh chat room's favorite chapter this week and oh, i'm giving it mine too yeah so. i i feel like we could actually do this pretty quickly my hero academy won my chapter of the week and uh all might is my character of the week as well I, yeah it was it was not the stiffest competition this no. week unfortunately it was like everyone put their best effort in last week and then they were all like shit you did god damn it you did do everybody even bleach fuck and then this like week that- was the only time that like you know, like Horikoshi Sensei is like, oh, sweet. <laughs> it's like that. Uh, it's like that one plot arc at towards the end uh, of uh, uh, Bakuman, where everyone is trying to beat uh, <laughs> Nimaya, 
and so they all put their best things out uh, after putting everything in and meanwhile he's still just running rampant through it <laughs> and still beating them every single week yeah it was a, a very good chapter for for Bart, my hero yeah I mean just I think that we should t- focus a little bit more on the positives rather than the lack of competition uh, because seriously like the moment that the moments that All Might has in that chapter are really really good um, you know the flashbacks, the moment of reflection, the implication that this very well might be the end of him, uh, but his determination to, to persist on, um, n- not just for his society's sake, but for Deku's sake, to be there for him, to mentor him, uh, and the final counterpunch, uh, all really good. And that chapter basically is all about him and all for one and they're both really really good contributions to that chapter yeah, it's a brilliant chapter um it it makes all might a great hero which is what this series is about it's great seeing the other heroes fighting to give him the best opportunity they can and i love how important it is to him to stay alive not for himself not even necessarily be a, a symbol anymore he's like i can't die because i need to keep mentoring deku and we know it's an inevitability thing. We know he's going to die. You know, he's he's been saying that he's losing his power, but it's nice to see the efforts he's going to go through because he's like, I'm not done teaching Deku yet. I won't be a failure to that. And that's it. Yeah. Let's so, wrap it up. Let's bring this home. All right. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us for Weekly Manga Recap. We tend to record the show Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on hitbox.tv slash T. Sometimes, however, we do need to change things up, but why are you stabbing your eye? Oh, oh no. no. I couldn't figure out where my finger was supposed to go. I was like, I was like pointing up as though they're also on my webpage right now. Follow us at T at my ruler of time, at WMR Podcast. Uh, that last one is our official podcast Twitter account, and we tend to, uh, Chris tends to put stuff that is most relevant to the podcast on there. Uh, also, be sure to check out our past episodes on Weekly Manga Recap at Podbean.com, on iTunes, and on our YouTube channel, Weekly Manga Recap, all one word. And uh, on iTunes, we have a comment or rating so that we can help, you can help us beat the woodworking podcast in the hobby section. No one has done it in a while. I feel like, uh, We've, we've lost the woodworkers. I didn't want to make this announcement on air. It's been a great five years, but the woodworkers have bought out Weekly Longer Recap. They're uh, going to put us in their wooden prison that they've just finished <laughs> yeah, making. Yeah, I, I think they're gonna. I think that, I don't think they're gonna keep us. I think they're purchasing us mostly just to destroy us. They're they're like the Vince McMahon of podcast. They're gonna purchase us just to own our library and then shit all over us in a podcast once. <laughs> This is going to be like an event gonna, podcast where we invade them, and then by the end of the podcast... They... repeatedly over the course of several months in a row yeah. to their working stars, their, their WWE woodworking <laughs> entertainment stars. <laughs> Just shit all over us and then fire us. Oh, God. Ah, oh, that DDP guy. Oh, he couldn't, he couldn't carpenter anything. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh... Anyhow, if you have questions you wanted to ask us or manga you want to suggest that we read, you can send that stuff to us via email, weeklymangarecap at yahoo.com. We appreciate all the stuff you guys sent us. Special thanks also go out to our Patreon supporters. Your support allows us to create all sorts of bonus content for you guys to enjoy. Uh, We do Q&A episodes. We do movie commentary streams. And, of course, we do the bonus podcast once a month, available only for champion-level subscribers. Uh, every little bit, however, helps out. We appreciate every bit of it, and it's very flattering that you guys are actually like willing to support us in that way. Thank yes. you very much. Special thanks uh, goes to Richard Wodecki, who is our newest Patreon, our newest patron. Thank you very much, sir. It is much appreciated. If we'd both do that, it's like we're actually beating him up as opposed to... Oh, and, do you want to, if we do it at the same time and then, like, release at the same time, it looks like we're fist bumping and, like, magically just deleting leaving him out. giving it to just him. leaving him out, yeah. Well, no, like, he's the internet that we're then fist bumping so it's through. A, it's a three-way fist yeah, bump. Yeah, it's like, up. boom, and then they're a part of it. But if we both come at the screen, then it's like we're attacking him. <laughs> 
Thanks as well go out to the guys who really help us to put this podcast together. Steve the woodworkers. <laughs> They've built the foundation for us to... to We're just us. following their path. Who do you think made my desk, Chris? A <laughs> woodworker. <laughs> uh, Steve Manor Tiger Eyes, he does awesome work. You can see like the Koino Kodachi's uh, tile card here. Uh, and many, many other pieces that he has helped make for us over the course of like five years now uh, so thank you so much man uh neurotcfanboy.dvnr.com i drop booze at humber.com patreon.com slash steve man and other locations yes. you can follow him on and uh check out his artwork he does commissions everything like that if you ever want to check out his work just message him he's a great guy he'd love to help and of course infamous planet uh, oh he's a fuck don't don't do anything for him screw him oh <laughs> No, no shout out for Infamous Planet this yeah. week, I guess. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Be happening. <laughs> uh, anyhow, to close things out, the recommendation we're going to be taking for next week. Now, Chris. Okay. I said at the start of the year, you need to do some bad series. Okay. I'm it's already... a bad series, and I needed a little bit of a break from them. But you know what? When was the last one we the last really bad one we did. I guess you could say, like, Shinsuke you know, Iron Man was pretty bad. I liked it, though. <laughs> yeah, it was enjoyably bad. Uh, and it's been a while even since we did that one. You know, we spent last month doing, uh, you know, series that we basically took ourselves, series that individually each of us enjoy. And then we took Koi no Kodachi, which is a series that we came away thinking very positively of. It's time to go back to the well. And uh, so this recommendation comes to us from someone who actually sent it as a recommendation for uh, Valentine's Day uh, with a group of romance manga saying, here are some bad ones, here are some good ones. Uh, the series is called Kyo Koi o Hajimam. Hang on. Kyo Koi o Hajimimas. Or, much easier to say, today I'll start our love. So, <laughs> It's a very Englishy title. Today, uh... I'll start our love. It's a shoujo romance manga. Uh, oh, actually, shoujo as well. Okay. I'm just going to read the uh, description that uh, she sent us, which was, Do you like series where characters are able to overcome extreme bullying? Where despite everything that's done and said to them, they're still able to be themselves? Well, too bad! <laughs> this is a series about a girl who decides to give in to the bullies and falls in love with a guy who not only bullies her, but also encourages other characters to bully her and even tries to rape her at one point. Oh, Jesus. After this, after fucking a silent voice? So thank you for that recommendation. Uh, she did not include her name in a sign-off anywhere, so I have to, I'm going to keep her uh, anonymous, but uh, thank you very much for that recommendation. That's what we're taking. Thank you. Uh... uh I'm looking forward to this one. <laughs> I don't think you are. Uh, that's going to do it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure on what note we should end on. I just like, I, I'd like to think that you're like, well, that's the episode, and I just see a nick shaped cloud of dust, and I hear NXT turned on on the background. <laughs> Whoa, <a> suplex! <laughs> Fuck out! <laughs> Jim Ross is calling it. <laughs> He's back.